When we saw those owls, both times, I heard a voice in my head and the voice said, this has something to do with the UFOs. Classic gray aliens with the big bald head and the big black eyes were walking towards the house. And I was the only one in the house and I should have been terrified. And I heard a voice in my head that said, oh yes, they're here. Now is the time to put your head on the pillow and black out. Just went boop, right to sleep. And I dismissed it completely as a dream. And we think we know how things work, but the truth is we probably have a very limited understanding. How can we? Set of lights goes over the parking lot, like this craft. Everything in the parking lot turned red. The cars turned red, the trees turned red, the sky turned red, the asphalt turned red. And that's something that very rarely gets reported in UFO reports. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Mike Clellan, and he is a UFO researcher and author, and we're going to be doing an interesting uh, podcast, and so check it out. up in Michigan, and I was, um, I'm 60 now, 61 now, I just turned 61 a couple weeks ago, and um, I lived this kind of, like, leave it to beaver lifestyle in the suburbs of Detroit, and I went to New York City and studied uh, film. Uh, for a year and dropped out of college. And then I worked as a professional illustrator in New York City for 10 years. So okay. I was, I had a nice apartment. I was full on yep. Yeah, I was, I lived, that was in the 80s. So from 81 to 90, and oh, it was great. And then after that, I moved what I thought would be for one year. I was going to be a ski bum for one year and it turned into 25 years. <laughs> so it was a ski bum out west for, for about half my life. So I moved to Wyoming and then Idaho and then just put all my energies into skiing. And I ended up working for an outdoor school and teaching mountaineering in Alaska for a decade or so. And so that was a big change for New York City. And during that time, I, um, I really got a huge, deep appreciation of the mountains and the wilderness and being outside. And that became a really important part of my life. And Somewhere in there, I started looking into what would have been. Um, I had a, I had I had some experiences with owls. You know, I can jump right into that if you want. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2006, I would have been 44 years old, and I was living in a little town called Dre, Idaho, which is right on the Wyoming border. It's right near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So it's in this beautiful part of the world. It's right next to the Grand Teton National Park, and right next to Yellowstone's just an amazing part of the world as far as big wilderness. And so I had been working for the school all summer long up in Alaska. In the autumn, I came back down to the lower 48 and came back to the time where I was living. And the school I had a branch and there was a woman that worked at the branch and I got into a conversation with her and she was doing the in-town work. Her name is Kristen. I said, wow, you've been here all summer. Wow, you must have had a great summer camping out in the mountains all summer long. And she said, I haven't camped once. And so I was camping. I told my element camping. I said, I'll take you out camping for one night. And this was this was essentially a first date with a stranger. And it might sound odd, but in like a camping culture like that, that was pretty normal in a, in a town out west like that. So we went, hiked into the mountains just for one night. It was going to be beautiful weather, so we didn't bother in a tent. We just going to sleep out under the stars. Took a very minimal amount of gear. And we, we walked in and to tell the story properly, I have to include a couple of details. I was sitting on a rock making dinner. I was completely at peace. This is, I had spent all summer outside. So I was doing, I felt completely in my element and I was making dinner for both of us. And this was in a field of wildflowers and, and she was talking about something as the sun was setting. She was talking about something and I really took note of it. I said, wow, this is, this person is smarter and there's more depth to her than I, than I ever would have guessed. And it was at that moment, an owl flew over us and then a second owl and then a third owl. And these three owls flew over us for what must've been the next two hours. So as the sun was setting and as we ate dinner, the owls were flying around us. And this was, this was bear country. So what we did is we finished dinner and we just walked another you know, 10 minutes down the trail, different spot to sleep. So we weren't necessarily sleeping where we had cooked. Right. So we found a different spot to sleep and the owls followed us. And then when we laid down under the stars, we'd set our pads down on the ground 
and we were looking straight up into, into the night sky, into the stars, these owls would swoop down over our faces and they're eerily silent in flight. So for just that half a second, they would blot out the stars. It was totally magical. It's totally magical. And so that so the next morning we get up and we're like, wow, that was great. We walk back to town and just and I said, hey, that was really wonderful. Let's do this again sometime. And she said, I, I'd love to. So four days later, we just we went out for another night. And as the sun was setting, four owls, excuse me, three owls. Is four days later, three owls started flying over us again. We were in a different part of the mountains, many miles away from where we were before. And when it happened, them, those would be kind of off at a distance. They'd be kind of landing on a branch over there. They'd kind of fly past us. This time, no, they were like, they were landing at our feet. And to have it happen once was pretty cool, but to have it happen twice was like positively mystical. And I did not talk about this at the time, but I'm talking about it now. When we saw those owls, both times I heard a voice in my head and the voice said, this has something to do with the UFOs. Were, I was looking at real you, owls. Were you like a UFO enthusiast uh, before that at all? I had, I had been reading a lot at that point. So for the, for the previous, I bet you 10 years, I was reading a lot about UFOs and the UFO literature and the research. So, um, so yeah, so I was pretty well versed at that point with the, with the, with the UFO lore. Right. But so, so I was like looking at real owls and I heard that voice in my head and that really, that more than anything was the, like changed the direction of my life. So this is a pretty simple story, right? It's I went camping with a, with a woman, we saw some owls, but it really, really truly changed the direction of my life, which, which I didn't, Looking back at it now, it's it's sort of a simple story, but wow, did it have an impact on my life. What happened was after that, I started a blog, and the blog was mostly talking about synchronicities or very powerful coincidences in my life, and which I had a lot of. And I was so I started in that story that I, the story I just told of the, seeing the. Owls with Kristen was uh, it was one of the first posts I put on the blog when I when I started writing back in 2009. It would have been three years after the event, and Kristen and I were still good friends. She had moved out of the valley, and I was wondering what were we talking about the very first when we saw those very first owls. And I called her up and I said, "What were we talking about?" And she said, "Oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about." She said, "I was giving my deepest definition of what God means to me." Now that that I recognize, like I'm not a at all a churchy person, but I recognize like the sort of mythic power to that, to her statement, talking about something so, so highly charged at that moment when the first owls appeared. So what happened was I, I in the, like right after the event with the three owls, I started looking up, started researching owls and I started researching UFOs. And most particularly I had some events in my youth, in my I had, I'm happy to talk about any of these. I had a um, close-up UFO sighting when I was 12, where I was uh, at a friend's house. His name is Kenny. I was at his house and it was like, a, we were little kids having a sleepover. And I looked out the window. I can't remember if it was him or me. I was at his house, but we looked out the window and we saw this thing that was sort of shaped like a coffee can. Sort of like, this is a water puddle, but obviously it was like this thing was rotating at this very odd angle and it was rotating down like this sort of a coffee can shaped thing in the night sky. And it didn't look like, didn't match anything, didn't match a balloon, didn't match a helicopter, didn't match an airplane. And I, and, and it, we watched for about 30 seconds and it disappeared. And then I remember we ran downstairs and I drew it and I still have the drawing. So, um, and then also around that time, I had a missing time of it, which is a term used in the lore of like UFO contact when someone, so I was walking home from a high school football game with a friend. I was 12 years old. Right. High school football game was at Friday nights and there a, was a spot on the sidewalk in my neighborhood. This was a totally idyllic suburbs, completely safe, beautiful night. 
And I wanted to be home at 9.30. And I told my parents I'd be home at 9.30. So there was a spot on the sidewalk. I know right where it happened. And it felt like the sky just like click lit up totally. The entire sky lit up orange. And then click went back to normal. Both me and my friend were like, what just happened? And so it was just a few houses further down the block to my house. And I went into my house. Uh, my friend lived a little further into the neighborhood. So he walked home and I got into the house and my parents were waiting up for me. And they were like, why are you so late? And I said, I'm not late. I said, I'd be home at 930. It should be around 930. And they said, it's 1130. And, the, and I remember I remember clearly the 11 o'clock news was ending. So that would have been about 1130. So I was, so there's two hours I can't account for. Now this was, I was 12 years old. This was long before I had any knowledge of like what the term missing time might mean. And I was just more like confused that my parents were angry at me for, for something that I don't feel like I did. And um, so these events and a couple more were in my life. Um, there was one other one that was stood out where I, when I was 30, I went camping with Kristen when I was 30, so 14 years earlier. As a young man, I was living in rural Maine and I was alone in the house and I sat in bed and there was a bright light shining through the window. And I looked outside and there were what would be five of what the classic gray aliens with the big bald head and the big black eyes were walking towards the house. And I was the only one in the house and I should have been terrified. And I heard a voice in my head that said, oh yes, they're here. Now is the time to put your head on the pillow and black out. And I break to sleep and I dismissed it completely as a dream. And now I, I'm very suspect of what may or may not have happened that night. So, um, um, so those events were in my life when I heard the voice in my head that said, you know, the looking at real owls and the voice said, this has something to do with UFOs. So I started looking into my UFO experiences, my own memories. And I started reaching out to UFO researchers and they would put me in touch with other people. So very quickly, I found a little network of people I could talk to. And because of the owls, I would ask everyone the same question. I would say, have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And it wasn't 100%, but it was, and it didn't take long before um, I was putting the blog, I was writing little essays about owls and UFO contact and interesting owl stories. So it was very quick that, if anyone, anyone in the world had an odd experience with an owl, especially with the, in, in the context of a UFO sighting, they would find me. You just type it. You can do it right now. Type in UFO owl on the first thing that comes up. I'm about the next 25 things under that. So if anyone anywhere in the world has an experience with a powerful, like, mystical experience with an owl, they're going to find me. And I started, it started out as a trickle. I would get stories coming in. And that very quickly turned into a flood of stories. So for the last 14 years, 15 years, I have, I have, um, I have been at the receiving end of a flood of stories. I'm getting, lately, I've been getting like five a day. And, and I cannot keep up with them. I can send a little note back. Thank you for your letter. And I can't keep up with them. I can't do the, people are reaching out to me with like what would be the most Oftentimes they'll begin their letter like this is this, this is a story I can't tell my wife. This is a story I can't tell my boss. This inside myself. But I'm reaching out to you, make basically me. And then they share these absolutely dreamlike stories involving owls. And I have been archiving and collecting and trying to make sense of these stories for about the last 15 years. And it has turned into a full-time job. So, and it's turned into, there's, I've got three big fat books that are the culmination of these studies. So, so how so are the, you? So yeah, there was a long question. There was a long answer to your question. Yeah. So, right. so how are you doing the research um, on this? I mean, you, you're not, you're not able to even keep up with the volume that's coming in. Like, are you reaching out to, did you initially, um, reach out to oh i make an effort to reach out sure but okay. people coming to me then i can reach then i can respond to yeah and what what is the conclusion you've come to that there's a what is the connection that you've come up with 
So the connection is definitive, you know, there's no so that definitively. Exactly. So I can dance around, I can speculate what may be. So what I can say with absolute certainty is that owls and UFOs are somehow connected. There is a connection there somehow. And then having gathered so much, so many owl stories, five things that seem to be connected with, with owls. One of them is UFO contact or a close-up UFO sighting. That's certainly connected to owls. The other would be um, meditation. People who meditate often have powerful owl experiences. And these feel, these have the same flavor and mood as the, the stories that emerge around the UFO sighting. And then um, mushrooms, people, psychedelics, particularly mushrooms, people taking psychedelics will often see owls. And it's not in like a visionary trip, like a, like a, though I certainly, that's part of it. I mean, people will take mushrooms and then an owl will show up and multiple people will see it. So um, I've got a lot of stories like that. Um, the time around the time of shamanic initiation. So this is, this is something, this is something I did not expect. So when someone is studying to be a shaman, and I've had shamans reach out to me and share their stories. And there's a there's a community of shamans, present day. It's not part of like the core of our Western culture, but they're out there on Indian reservations and people studying shamanism um, in North America. And then people I've contacted, people all over the world that have had these experiences. So people who are going through the initiation project, a process, the initiation process to become a shaman will see owls. This is a remarkable aspect to it. And then the final one is owls and death. Owls will show up around the time of death, usually after someone dies, usually after a loved one dies. It's the most of the stories I have, I have are a child whose parent has died, an adult child, their parent dies. And then an owl will show up shortly after the parent dies. And the child will talk to the owl as if it is their parent. I have this story so many times in my files. And um, usually it's associated with the, the end of the grieving process. Like communicating, talking to an owl as if it is your dead parent will, in my, in the, within the stories people have reached out to me, will the grieving process will, will end. So like these are wild, powerful, emotional stories that people are reaching out to me with really highly charged. So I, so there's five things, those five, it's one of them is UFO contact. So I, I feel that the owl is more connected to what I've been calling highly charged human experience, which would be UFO contact, um, meditation, psychedelics, shamanic initiation, and those five things, there might be more out there, but this is, these are the patterns that I'm clearly seeing in my research. And so I, I feel that the owl is more connected to the high charged human experience and UFO contact is just one of the modes, if okay. that makes sense. So you're saying, so you're saying like maybe they would have, somebody would have some kind of interaction with an, with an owl or owls and then shortly thereafter or before um, have a, a, some type of a experience with a, a UFO. So here's, here's, here's this, is the, this was one of a story I got very early on in my research. And then this story has repeated over and over and over again. This is what's what I would, is a very simple, straight, easy to digest story. Some of them get very trippy and very strange. So a guy named Derek, I sat with him. He's a friend of mine, sat in the bar with him. He told me this long story. He contacted me and we met up and, and he was camping in Arizona. And there's a, um, big cactus and him and his buddy are looking up at the nighttime sky. And then they notice there's an owl on top of this cactus, and they both get the same feeling. They're like, Whoa, this is, this is more intense than I expected. Like, like an owl has a sort of an ominous presence, and they felt it. Right. And then the owl flew off. They'd watched it for a minute. It flew off. And then moments later, a triangle shaped craft silently passed directly over them and then went down the, the canyon, it sort of hugged the landscape. And this guy, Derek, wow, did he fight to try to describe the eeriness and the strangeness of the flight pattern of this, this triangle-shaped craft. It didn't match a helicopter, it didn't match any kind of normal craft, made absolutely no noise, which is consistent in the reporting. 
Um, a couple of days later, he sees another UFO, this time in full daylight. It's a dot in the sky. And it follows him as he's driving. And then he kind of shares some stories and he said, you know, I was having these dreams and I was having kind of spiritual, you know, kind of like um, powerful synchronicities. And I was, and, and this all led to a uh, spiritual awakening. And I, I used to not talk about this aspect of it. And I've talked to researchers and stuff like that. This is very common. People who will have like a close-up UFO sighting, well, often it'll be spiritual awakening or change in their religion. And right. that has that is that is well understood and consistent in the research. So right. So you were, you, um, no, I was going to say right. I remember you saying that uh, with Danny's um, you had yeah. a whole discussion on how it would it, you know how w some of the research papers they actually well, that's one of the questions they ask the the more analytical researchers you know well that's one of their their questions right it's like, certainly something I ask yeah out? right yeah well I usually I wait for people to tell me. Like they've had a spiritual awakening or the change in their religion or, you know, what's another odd thing is people will go back to college and study physics, <laughs> which is a, fun, that's, that's a funny commonality too, that shows right. up in the, in the, in the, I mean, it's a pattern. It's obviously not everyone. So, so, um, so in the last, I mean, so these stories have taken over my life and I'm not going to run out of stories. I can, I just, I'll, they, the, uh, and I've been trying to, to answer the question, why owls? Why are would be there just one of a highly charged event? And then you could also sort of take it back and say, is the UFO contact experience some sort of initiatory event? Like if people are having a spiritual awakening, I mean, is, is the UFO causing the spiritual awakening? These are very murky. I mean, questions are good. It's good to ask the questions. Wow, is it tough to get it? definitive answer on anything like that well all i can say is i'm seeing a pattern that people are having a, a, a pattern in the experiences that people are having in conjunction with ufos and owls and let me also say that i am not looking at like the wide spectrum of ufo um research i mean there's all kinds of stuff going on from government conspiracies to um uh you know all kinds of different experiences that people are having and people are reporting and sightings but i'm just looking at the thin little narrow sliver within the big collective totality of the data i'm just pulling on the thread of ufos and owls and so my my research is sort of skewed because i'm so focused on this one little narrow thread and what i found is that there is a richness and a power to the stories that i just find like it really keeps me going it keeps me going as far as to keep totally invested and involved in the research. So I have a question. What, what, what do you think the UFOs are? So, so the pop culture thought is that they're, then this certainly might be true or partially true is that they're metal spaceships coming from some place in the galaxy or beyond our galaxy or from another galaxy, they have arrived here through space travel and they are essentially little scientists studying humans, right? So we right. have an analogy, like I lived right next door to Yellowstone. I knew grizzly bear researchers who would go into the mountains of Yellowstone in a helicopter and they would dart a grizzly bear and then they would weigh it and do medical exams on it and study it. And then they would tag it and then release the, bear into the wild and they would study that bear and that's movements with the with the tags that they, until you really look at the data because what happens is that the stories that emerge are much stranger than 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 that that than simply metal spaceships from another planet this why would someone have a spiritual awakening after interacting with scientists from another planet so so I, so you asked what, what what I think the UFO is. I I say that the UFO parallels lots of other mythologies throughout history. One of one in which I, I'm not. There's a lot of research on this. Is ancient Celtic fairy mythology, the modern UFO lore, very consistently. There's all kinds of issues where, like um, uh, just how they interact with people. So the fairies, the fairies lived in the forest and that would be the, the lore. 
the UFOs seem to live in the stars, and but the the lore is similar. How the fairies would interact with and that goes, um, and I would also say even back to like almost Greek gods and that type of mythology seems to mimic the the UFO mythology in the sense that that people are interacting with some some other energy. It's not from here. It's from some other realm, like the realm of gods or the realm of um, you know, of the of the nature spirits or the folklore spirits. I, that I, but so that that's been a very fruitful avenue of research. To look at it that way. It's hard to know what's truly going on. Yeah, I was going to say I I I wouldn't be shocked if the bear didn't have a spiritual, um, you know, awakening after being tagged and <laughs> probably terrified or yeah, angry yeah. and then falling asleep and then waking up and realizing being a little groggy and walking off. I mean, so, yeah. you know, I mean, it would, so he traumatized that we, you know, yeah, so that, a little traumatized, yeah. like what just yeah. happened? Um, it's probably a lot more wary of humans after that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I get a ton of people, I, I've done a few of these videos. So where I've interviewed um, guys that have different, you know, takes, uh, either, either they've had, um, you know, encounters, or they've done a lot of research. And, you know, in the comment section, I, I tend to get this a lot, which is that they're, that aliens or UFOs are, I don't know, there's some kind of, they always, they, not always, but some, many of them have some kind of connection with like fallen demons or fa fallen mm -hmm. angels or their demons. There's a whole kind of connection there. And, and I, which is odd to me because I, I grew up thinking, of course, you know, the, the, you know, the coming from another solar system to monitor humans mm -hmm. or interact with humans somehow or um but then the more i've learned about just you know the distances and it, one it's like why would they be interested in us and two to be able to travel that far like we don't really have anything to offer them or you know you've i've got buddies that i have a buddies that thinks that you know he's got the whole conspiracy theory where they're helping to run the world with the it's like why you know, like stop. Oh, like, I've heard all these that. stories. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've heard way more than me. But you know, what I always go back to is like even the angels and demons uh one, it's kind of like how I feel about God. It's you know, like a cat doesn't understand what's really going on. Mm -hmm. He understands that there's this this thing this human that feeds him and he lives in this house and he, he comes and goes a little bit and he gets scratched, and he, but he has no real concept of how things work. And we think we know how things work, but the truth is we probably have a very limited understanding of what's really yep. happening. I mean, how, you know, how can we? So I, so I'm always curious to know like, well, what do you think? So as insane as maybe the angels and the demons thing, sound does it really it doesn't it's no more insane than traveling you know hundreds of billions of light years to come to this little rock circling this little tiny sun like that's all of these i just don't think we're capable of probably really understanding what's happening but i'm, I'm super curious about it even though i think if the, I, I think if you could if you could communicate with a cat and explain to him what's happening, he wouldn't be able to understand. Yep. Just so, just like if aliens came down and really explained it to us, I don't think we would be able to, I can't conceive of how large the galaxy is. Just or it, so, so in many ways, like the galaxy is big, infinite in space, right? right? So, and I think if you talk to a, and we, the more we learn about it, the bigger it seems to get. Every time we put a new telescope up in space, we're like blown away, but it's bigger than we thought. And, and right. the same thing is happening to the, to the people who are working with electric microscopes. They're looking, looking, looking at the, at the, at the, you know, the structure of the atom and the structure of like the very tiny times. And that seems to be growing in its, in an infinite way. And then the people who are doing psychic research are finding out that the potential of human psychic 
abilities is bigger, stranger, richer than we had ever expected. So all these things that we think we know, it's, they're ever expanding. I would, so, so yes, so I agree. So it's not just that the space is so big, but that you talk to um, advanced physicist and they would, there's like a multiple, I can't explain it. So I'm not a physicist, but there's a, there's a seems to be within physics, seems to be a recognized understanding that there are multiple dimensions. We are in this dimension, so we we, we can't tr picture what another dimension is like because it's it's beyond our physical, like we're stuck here. We're, we're like in this reality, but there seems to be multiple realities. And that would, that would answer some of, you know, where the UFOs are coming from. Are they simply coming from another reality that we don't understand? And that is certainly where the, let's say, the um, the Greek gods lived in some other reality. They had some abilities that you know we don't have. This is mythology, you know. But but I and I would say that the here's here's where I'm looking at this now. The owl, there's ancient owl mythology. Let me talk about it just a little bit because it's yeah. So the, yeah, the owls all throughout the world. There's a consistent mythology. The owl is is a night bird. And it can fly through the forest in complete darkness, right? So it can fly in the forest in complete darkness. And that to ancient man must have seemed magic, right? So we now, we think about evolution and they certainly, they have evolutionarily developed the ability to have, to see, to have very sensitive eyes. So that's why they can fly in. in so, but to ancient man, it must have seemed magic. Magic. And we live in a world now where we have an electric light bulb, but in my like great grandfather's life, there were no light bulbs. So it's very it's it's very new in the human experience that the the night has lost its mystique. So the owl was a creature of the night and it flew into the forest and in all those folklores, that becomes a metaphor for flying to the land of the ancestors, for fl flying to the land of the dead, for flying to that other realm. And then the owl would come back with a message that would be the follow-up myth. So the owls in, in a lot of lore all throughout the world is a messenger from that other realm, that, that realm of the night. So that shadow realm, that dream realm would is now that's the ancient mythology. Turn the clock forward present day, we have Harry Potter, who has an owl that delivers the mail, right? This is the most popular series of books in the history of publication. It has an owl that delivers the mail. It has an owl that is a messenger. It's perfect. It's So that is not ancient mythology. It's right now in our popular culture. The owl delivers the mail for Harry Potter. It's perfect. It's right there. So I would, I am looking at and I get a little, I get like on my high horse sometimes, but like, so I'm seeing the owl, the ancient mythology of the owl as mimicking the modern mythology of the UFO, right? So we don't know what the UFO is any more than we know what the Greek gods were, any more than we know what the fairies are or, or these other folklores or these other mythologies. We can speculate, yes, we can scientific terms about them because they seem to be in metal spaceships and things like that. But we, who knows, maybe someone doing secret research that knows a whole lot more than I do. But from where I'm sitting, it's a genuine mystery. And then the ancient myth of the owl is mimicking, mirroring the modern mythology of the UFO. The UFOs are coming. People are being told all kinds of things by the UFO occupants. Some of it is pretty simple. Clean up your act. Be very careful with nuclear power. Be very careful with nuclear bombs. Like basically, they're painting a picture of of mankind who has is not using our technology responsibly. Right? We're going to cause pollution on the planet. We're going to cause we're 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 potentially we could do a lot of damage to the planet. And that's a that's a uh, a message that keeps on coming through. But in a funny way, I mean, that was the message of half of the Twilight Zone episodes too, right? So that's not that's not like anything new or anything that we don't understand inherently, but that's the message that's coming from those beings if if we're to trust, you know, what they're saying. Okay. So... And then... What do you think... Oh, go on. So what, what do you think the UFOs are? 
I think so. And I'm going to, this is, I'm going to talk a little poetically. Let's say I would say the UFOs are a modern manifestation of a myth that we need right now. Right. So the old myth, we, you would have had a myth, you know, you would have been one valley and you would be in one Indian tribe and then over the hill and the other valley would be another Indian tribe. So each tribe would have their own myth and they would be a, their own community. And those myths are no longer serving mankind anymore because we no longer live in a tribal society where one tribe lives in one valley and one. We live in a global society. So we are being presented with a global myth. We are being presented not with fairies forest or wolves, you know, speaking to the elders around the campfire. We are being presented with a, a visitor from what seems to be outside of Earth. So we are being presented with a global mythology. It is like, it's not it's not oh go on. Like a collective consciousness that we're all kind of plugged into, kind of like a young Jungian thing. I'm not so you're saying so that I'm, it's not a real thing. Uh, oh, it's well certainly earn marks in the ground. There's trace evidence. There's some physicality to these UFOs. So th this okay. is very murky because there's a thing. There's a real phenomenon, but okay. the mythology of it, we are confronting the other, and it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a global mythology where we are interacting with something beyond our Earth plane. If that makes sense, so yeah. so so we are we are, can no longer look at ourselves as just you know either Americans or Russians or Chinese or however you want to put it. We have to look at ourselves in the in the reflection of the UFO thing as citizens of the Earth rather than citizens of a of a tribe or a nation. So so you a question like like what's how does what's the purpose of the mythology? I guess is what you're asking. I'm not sure now. I'm but and and then I'm very much open to sort of a Jungian collective idea too. Carl Jung wrote a book. It's a thin little book. Um, it's called uh, Flying Saucers, A Myth in the Skies. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. He published it in the late fifties. Yeah. Very early on in the UFO lore. And he took those, he took, he takes it very, he's, he writes beautifully on exactly that, the dilemma of something leaving physical trace evidence at the same time, something presenting itself in such mythological contexts. Okay. A myth made. Yeah. Yeah. So Carl Jung wrote a book. Carl Jung wrote a book, Flying Saucers, A Myth Made in the Sky. And it's a tough read. I've, wow. Is it a dense read? Um, all right. What do you, so I have a question. What do you make of like these, the, the Navy pilots and, the, um, mm -hmm. you know, the congressional uh, hearings were they hearings? We, are they, they, yeah. they? It's funny they weren't actually in Congress, so they weren't congressional hearings. There's some that have been in Congress, and there's some that have been outside of Congress in just like a, um, just like a symposium of sorts. So okay. the most recent one with the fellow Grush was not in. I don't think that was in, in the, Congress building. I think that was in another building. So it's the so it's a little murky. Some of them are congressional. So yes, they, what do I think of those? Like I'm yeah, like, what do you, what do you I, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm so immersed in the mystical side of it. And then I'm certain Navy pilots are seeing things flying around the sky. Absolutely. That's there's a, there was a book in the 1990s called um, Above Top Secret. And I think the Timothy Good was the, was the author. And it was basically that, that Tic Tac report kind of story, right. just military stories by the hundreds in that book. Just a wealth of those stories. So those stories have are, are out there. They've been out there for 50 years. And um, so there's nothing really necessarily new about the Tic Tac report, except for the fact that the Navy has been so open about talking about it. That's what's new. So well, I mean, why, I... they're, why they're interested in why they're talking about it now, I can't answer. Some gave him permission or he said, okay, you're allowed to talk about it. Or before you were not allowed to talk about it. Now you're allowed to talk about it. What who made that decision and said it was okay to talk about it. That's what's interesting to me. But the, um, so I would love to talk to the Navy pilots and I, right. I should be curious. So there's, and I would love to ask them like, has your religion changed? Have you had a spiritual awakening? I may say no, but I would want to ask those, those exact questions, those kinds of questions. How has your life changed since the event? You know, 
I mean, obviously they, some of them have been on 60 minutes and more famous and they can, you know, they were on the front page of the New York times. So there's that, yeah, but I mean, how, how has your life changed? How has your spirituality changed? Those are the questions I would ask. And they may not answer, you know, consistent with the people. I would also ask if you had any odd owl experiences too. They may not have had any, but I would ask that. Yeah. I wonder it's, I wonder Yep. I, I mean, if the if the government has time, why not openly talk about it? I mean, I have my own theory, you know, as to what I, what I think. I mean, I think that, you know, if these things have been going on and if they've been looking in and consistently kind of denying it or putting a spin on mm -hmm. it or, you know, I, I think that the culture of the 40s and 50s is vastly different than the culture we have now mm -hmm. because you know when i grew up they well when i grew up you when you grew up too we're about the you're not that much mm -hmm. older than me um you know they it was not it, it was it was it was a vastly different there was a vastly different um the, the, People looked at it vastly different. You know, you mm -hmm. would be mocked. You'd be it'd be mocked or ridiculed if you said that you had seen something or you'd been taken or you had, you know, whatever the the case may be. Um, you know, even saying, "Hey, I I think I saw the backyard in my backyard," like that would have spread through high school, and people would be saying he's crazy. And so, and now, and and now, listen, when the when the Tic Tac thing came out, like there was, it was like. The government came out and said, yeah, this is true. We caught these things. We don't really know what they are for sure, but we definitely have them on uh, on radar, on video. And there's it, tons of, there have been sightings for decades now and nothing, I nothing. Know, t t totally, totally. Yeah. Okay. Crickets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's don't interesting. The church, there's a little YouTube videos and their little article now and again, but wow. Everybody paid their anything. mortgage. Everybody, paid, yeah. but I think in the 1950s it may have been a different 50s, 60s, 70s. I think there may have been a vastly different um, reaction by society. So I'm in a writing, way, that, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm writing UFO books. I'm talking about my own UFO sightings in the books, like seeing five gray beings in the backyard. Like right. Like I'm talking about it, I have had essentially zero negative feedback. Some people may be saying stuff behind my back. And then there's comments on YouTube, which I don't pay attention to those kind of things. But but right. I have I have just the opposite, where it feels like people are thanking me for talking so openly about these issues. And that is a huge difference. And I think that's totally related to the advent of the internet and just the information moves around in a different way. And 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 uh so yeah, so it's been remarkable for me. You can't stop it anymore. Yeah. So, and I also think, you know, dripping that into our, you know, into society over the course of 50 years, 60 years, you know, you've kind of uh, acclimated everybody to the idea that there, you know, there are these beings that may possibly be among us or visiting us and it's going to, and it's okay because it's been 60, 60, 50, 60 years and nothing's really happened. You know, that nothing horrible has happened and they may be here and we don't necessarily are, but they are here and it's, it's going to be okay. And keep paying your car payment, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah, so you I think I, I could, yeah, I could see how, how you would, you could be concerned initially. And so you might hide, the government might hide it. Yeah. Um, and I, if I was in the Pentagon in like 1947, you know, and like that, you know, the news of the Roswell crash, like arrived at the desk and, right. and I was like the top brass, I would like, well, let's shut this up. I, right. I understand exactly why they didn't talk about it, but right. that was getting on 80 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, and you want to have the, you want to have answers. Like you, they don't have answers. You know, if, if they, they probably don't have, have answers, go ahead. So, you know, what do they have? You know, right. is it is it do they have um you know, do they simply have more file cabinets filled with more reports? Right. The problem is you fill up you're getting the same report over and over again, right? You get the same report over and over again for 80 years, very similar reports over and over again for 80 years. What do you right. what what is it telling you? Well, it tells you that there's definitely something there. 
But yeah, if you can't resolve it, then what do you say? So for me, the answer would be study a different aspect of it. Study the mystical side of it. You know, study the the weird side of it. You know, that's what interests me. You know, the the the. So here, let me. So here's this little story. Um, this woman contacts me. She was pulling into her driveway. She was on the phone and she pulls into her driveway and there's an owl in the driveway and it flies up into a tree. So she gets out of the car and she looks up at the tree and she calls her son out. She says, come on out, come on, let's look at the owl. So the owl flies, it touches her head. And the, the little boy is like, mom, are you okay? And she's like, oh no, it was so gentle, was so gentle. And then she, a couple days later, she goes hiking with a friend. She calls it her metaphysical friend. And they'd go hiking and they're in the, and there's a hiking trip going on time and they get back and it's getting dark. And it, it was, so they arrived back at the car and it was getting dark. And, and as they get in the parking lot, this set of lights goes over the parking lot, like this craft, what she called like a structured craft went right over the parking lot. And then she said, and everything, in the, the weird thing happened. Everything in the parking lot turned red. The cars turned red. The trees turned red. The sky turned red. The asphalt turned red. And that's something that very rarely gets reported in UFO reports. But I've heard that before, that everything will change to one color. I've heard it in green before, but I've never heard red. So everything turned red. And then, so the questions I ask is, what was going on in your life leading up to the event? And what changed after the event? And right. So the event would be the was the owl in a sense because the first thing that happened was the, so so what was happening leading up to the owl? She's on the phone with my dad, and I was telling my dad I'm going to donate my kidney. Tells me where she went to the a little a little league baseball game. Her son was playing little league, and there was another mom in the neighborhood. And she talked to this woman, and the woman she said, "How are you doing?" She didn't really know the woman, just just a neighbor. Of, and the lady says, well, not so good. I, I don't get a kidney. I'm going to die. And the woman says, I'll give you mine. And just like and the that, lady says, just like that. And I asked her, like, why did you say that? And I don't know. I just said it. It felt right. I've never gone back on it. So the woman says, oh, you have to have, it's not that easy. We have to be compatible. So I'll take the test. So she took the test and the doctor got back to her later and said, is this your sister? And she says, no, no, it's not my sister. And, and um, so he was talking on the phone with her father saying, I'm going to give my kidney away. She ended up giving the kidney to, the, to the, her, someone she didn't know very well. Both of them are completely healthy. Both of them are doing great. So she saved someone's life in the context of a UFO and an owl, an owl that touched her head. So when I do this research, do you know what Reiki therapy is? Reiki healing? No. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. So the people, <laughs> the people who I talk with, there's like, so Reiki is a is Japanese form of energy healing. So someone has a sore back, you would go to a Reiki therapist and you'd go to their office and they put their hands over your back and they wouldn't touch you. They would just send in Reiki means, I think it's Ray means uh, life energy and then, or life and then key means energy. So it's life energy. So you just, this, there's a, they would just put their hands over their back and then, and then ease the back pain or whatever it might be. And there's remarkable healing stories that are associated with this. So when I talk to people, I do, I talk to people on the phone all the time. I, I try to get back to everyone. I can't, but when I, I often talk to people on the phone and I, I just wait for them to tell me and I say like, what are you doing for work? And if they don't, and so they'll say, I'm a Reiki therapist. Or they're doing, or they're getting what's called their level three Reiki certification, or they're planning to, or they're or they're taking Reiki classes on to become a Reiki therapist. I would argue that half the people that I talk with, half, 50%, half the people who have had a UFO and owl experience are Reiki healers that i'll tell you 50 percent of the normal population is not a reiki healer that to me is a wild statistic so the lady 
Her name is Laura, the woman who gave up her kidney. I didn't have to ask if she was a Reiki healer. Like what form of, what more powerful healing can there be than giving your kidney away right. to save someone's life? So built into the, 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 I'm not looking at the big totality of the UFO stuff. I'm not looking at the tech. I'm talking to Navy pilots. I don't get radar returns. I'm talking to people who have had UFO and all experiences co-joined. They are some sort of healing work not all of them but a, i would say the majority of the people are doing healing work that to me is fascinating so you said why are they coming to earth why are they here right is to create healers i mean that's that's certainly what the evidence is presenting to me but again i'm not looking at the big totality of the picture i'm looking at that little sliver people who have ufo and all experiences are doing healing work not 100%, but wow, enough that there's a recognizable pattern. Yeah, I was going to say, or maybe that's just station, you know, of the the contacts. Like maybe it's it's odd that they're those types of healers. I mean, there's different people do, you know, they they do different things, different types mm -hmm. of, uh, of, you know, I guess alternative um, medicine or healing or mm -hmm. uh, it is odd that they're all, like you said, Reiki, you know, um, therapists. And odd. if they're not there's Reiki, that many. But I, I yeah. wonder if it's if it's not just kind of like you said the um, how most of these people or majority of the uh, of these people are having some kind of a a, a spiritual change mm -hmm. in their life as a result of a of an interaction, um, you know that's odd like that you know like obviously I agree thing, I agree if it's overwhelming if it's an overwhelming number even if it's more than half that's still you know some people are just not going to change. Um, but 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 this is i would love so the, i'm just one person right i'm just one right. person i would love to have like a even a i have thousands of stories on file right thousands i can't get it's all i just all in me no one else has looked at the files i'm just anecdotally kind of trying to see the patterns so i would love to have a staff and you know really crush the number of these things right what i so you talk, talked about like how people are saying, oh, it's the devil, it's demonic, it's it's the yeah. fallen angels. I'm not finding that in my research. I'm finding something else. I'm finding something optimistic. And and again, I'm not looking at the totality of the big picture. I'm looking at people who have UFO experiences. I'm finding that those people are, the people who are having these kind of powerful experiences, are, they are they're doing this healing work. They're, they're overcoming challenges. Um, here, I'll tell you one more story. So a woman uh, had, she had been having what would be UFO contact experiences. Okay. She was, she was terrified. She was working with a, with a, 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 like a support group and she was living on the West coast in, and um, she would take her dog out for walks and, and it was pouring down rain and she took the dog out for a walk in the pouring rain. And she walked out on this dock that was part of her walk. It's a big jetty that went out into the water. And so she's walking with her dog and she, she's like, what am I doing? Why am I walking in the rain? Why did I come out here in the rain? It's pouring down rain. I, I never would walk with the dog in the rain. So she turns on and as soon as she turns around, there's an owl standing on the dock facing her. She turns on this big owl facing her. The dog is super high strung. The dog should chase the owl. The dog sits down and just like, it's a, as if it's like attentive to royalty. Mm -hmm. So she stares at the owl. They look at each other. The owl flies off. Shortly thereafter, she had a pain in her arm. She went to the doctor and she had cancer. And she went through chemotherapy. And she said, I went right to the edge of death. Like I, like I almost died. And when I talked to her, she said, I've been cancer free for 15 years. And I, and, and I asked what, it, what, how has your life changed? She said before she, I, but, so I said, what do you think the owl meant? The owl meant get ready. Your life is going to change. Something's you're like, your life is going to get hard. It got terrible. She was the turd girl but she survived. And I said, how, like what, what's changed in the big picture? She said, before this event, I was scared of my own shadow. After all this, I am afraid of nothing. So there's, there's the owl seems to be in there as this, it's like punctuating a, 
a chapter in her life, a moment in her life between I was afraid of my shadow to I fear nothing. So I have those kinds of stories that have that kind of myth power built into the stories. That is the, that's the consistent thread. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hard as a researcher to, to keep pressing forward with this because the, um, because of the power of these stories, it just, it's, that's the flavor and mood of the stories I'm getting that both of these women, the woman who gave away kidney and then the woman who survived cancer, there are these beautiful, say parables, these beautiful parables interwoven into these. Um, so I was going to say, I, I interviewed a guy who was like in his house and you know, when you just said she was like, why am I outside in the rain where he was just in his house and suddenly he felt, you know, he didn't hear it, but he felt someone basically tell him go outside. And so mm -hmm. he just walked outside, like either the backyard or front yard, I forget, but he walked outside and he said, and there was a, you know, there was a, a, a UFO just, you know, hovering there. Very um, common. And I, you know, just same thing, you know, time, he missed a bunch of time and, uh, and then, Ran, got his family and they came out and they actually saw it also. And then it just disappeared. Um, and that's happened a few times to him. He actually has, um, has had multiple experiences, but your, your research is, you know, you're not hearing about the angels and, and demons part of it because you're, you're not reading the comment section because that's a cesspool. And that's where those, that's where I'm hearing, that's where I'm hearing those guys. Yeah. You know, you're actually talking to people. I'm saying that's where I'm getting it because in the comment section, yeah. people are, and you know. And I think that there's, that. that's like, that's a, like if you're a devout Christian, something like that, that would be a, 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 a an avenue to, to contemplate. But I think if you really studied the stories, you would, that, that would fall apart because it doesn't really match the, the, the lore of the biblical demon, let's say. Right. Um, people are certainly traumatized by these experiences. They, they produce a lot of fear and they produce a lot of confusion in people's lives. And people are angry. Some people are angry, but surprisingly the, the stories that I'm getting, as I say, you know, are just the owls and UFOs go joined. Um, they're much more buoyant and heartening. Well, like I said, you know, like I said earlier, you know, people are people are desperate to make it make sense to them and and have a, a, a clear understanding. And there just may not be a clear understanding because of just, you know, who we are, you know, our, our ability to understand. So, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, so they're, they're doing the best they can, you know. Uh, and I've, I've come to see the uh, owls as like an alarm clock, like they're here to wake us up. You know what that might mean. Wake us up to what is a kind of an open-ended question, but you know, owls as alarm clock. Yeah, when when you spoke with Danny, you were talking about how someone had driven by a, an owl that was huge. It was like four feet tall, four and a half feet tall, and and that oh, right. I guess at at some point they were saying it was like you will perceive us as an owl or something along those lines. So it was a way to and, implant a a, a cover. Of some yes. in some way, and that would be the, what's called the screen memory, and those those stories are are very common. Where people will see, let's say, the four foot tall owl on the side of the road, is a very common thing for people to report. There's no such thing as a four foot tall owl. Right. Too big. They're not that big. They will never be that big. So so the the, the that aspect is oftentimes when people are then hypnotized and they go through hypnotic regression and there's lots to, you know, so I, you, you have, there's reasons to be cautious about taking hypnotic regression at, at face value. But what is consistently being reported is the hypnotherapist will say, describe what the owl looks like. And the, the witness will say, well, they're bald. They've got big black eyes. They're wearing tight fitting little space suit. They're skinny. They're about four foot tall. And I don't think that's an owl. Mm -hmm. So they're describing a, a alien being on the side right. of the road, but what they are perceiving in the moment is an owl. Now that's, you hear that story 500 times and you get it. 
Like that's that's something that seems to be taking place with a with remarkable consistency. So um what that what the purpose and then also it's not just owls, it's owls and deer. Those are the top two. So people odd deer stories and then no therapist will say, well describe the deer and then they'll describe a quintessential gray alien. So yeah, it gets so I have tried to I certainly look at those stories. I certainly get a lot of those stories, but I tried I'm much more engaged and interested in the accounts of real owls showing up at the time of UFO contact. Okay. Do you have anything else? What else? Are uh, you I I mean, I could tell stories from, I mean, I got lots of stories, but yeah, this, this is a, <laughs> it's, mean, it's a genuine tree. So, so don't, don't, don't be for answers. I can only dance around and speculate what might may or may not, it might may or may not, mean, but um, it's a, we're, we are confronted with a genuine mystery. And, um, and for me, um, like, it feels like I've, like, it feels like there's magic in the universe, given how how deeply I've immersed myself in this research. I, I, there's there's something magical about the the way these are expressing themselves. They're, these are modern myths in the making, how I'm seeing it. How many books have you written about? Well, three nonfiction books on owls. This, this is the one, if anyone's going to start, this would be the one to start with. This is The Messengers. It's my first book on owls, and it's about 400 pages. It's the thickest one, and um, it reads pretty quickly, and uh, that's where I make the argument that owls and UFOs are connected, and then I just like got flooded with so much more information. There was, I've got people, so if I you take all three of my nonfiction books and stack them one on top of each other, it's a thousand pages of UFOs and owls, and people say, are you going to write another book on UFOs and owls? I'm like, uh-uh, like if I can't say it in a thousand pages, like, Right. I don't need to write it. Like if I can't say it, if I can't make my case in a thousand pages. So, um, and then I did do a, recently I did a, a, a fiction book and I'll just, this is, it's just on my desk here. This is the fiction book. It's called the unseen. And what that book is, is, um, is kind of, I said, I use the term flavor in mood. These owl and UFO stories have a flavor in mood. And I kind of tried to write a mystery thriller, kind of paranormal mystery thriller where the story it's in may like the, the the weirdest stuff in that fiction book is based on real events that people have it, shared with me. It's got a cowboy on the front. It has a cowboy on the front. Yes, it takes place. It's it says uh, yeah. It it's, takes place in the West, and there's a guy with a cowboy. Yeah. So I lived I lived in Idaho for a long time, so I was kind of like in cowboy culture there. So it was something I know a lot about. And you're gonna possibly start another YouTube channel at some point. I have a YouTube channel. I haven't done much with it lately, but I, but I, I did a podcast for ages. There's about probably 300 hours of me doing podcasts online, either through my first podcast, which is called hidden experience or my second podcast, which is called the unseen, which is the same name as the book. But, um, so the, um, and I found it very rewarding at the same time. I, I told, we talked about this a little bit. I can't, it's hard for me to multitask either I'm writing, right. putting all my energies into writing and if I try to write and do a podcast, I do both of poorly. So. I feel like you took your podcast much more serious than on my podcast. Because oh, I would I was very it was you know what it was it was for me. Was, yeah, I mean my my I'm podcast. Not, I'm, this is my podcast. Like it, it, you're yeah. you're going to get a thumbnail, and there's no editing. We're not. There's no music. There's no. It's going to be clipped. Clip maybe an, in, a, an intro, a thumbnail, we're putting it up. I feel like you Great. took yours much more seriously. I was um, doing audio only, so I wasn't doing video too, so. Video's great. Yeah. You have to do video great, you have to do video too. Then you just, yeah. you just pull off the audio and throw it up on StreamYard and it's another avenue for people to listen mm -hmm. to. I have a ton of listening on uh, StreamYard. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I sorry. StreamYard. What am I saying? I'm sorry. Spotify. I meant Spotify. Spotify. Yeah, yeah. And I and I um, my uh, it was funny because I was doing it in 2009, which was doesn't seem like that long ago, but that was very early on in the in the podcasting realm. So yes, like YouTube is m way bigger now, right? Like it's just got to be a, oh, yeah. a, a millions and t another hundred million people watching YouTube. At this, yeah, 
and then the number of podcasts that are out there. And this is before Apple podcasts and things like that. So. Okay. So okay. someday I'll get back into it. Yeah. You got to get back into it. It's fun. I know. It's good stuff. I know. And, 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 um, but as I said, I'm going to, I might the audio book. So I'm going to read that aloud into the microphone and then, and then edit that up and, and put it out as an audio book, the fiction book. All the book, audio books, except for the fiction book, which hopefully not would be very soon. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the interview. If you do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, hit the notified of videos like this. Also, leave me a comment in the comment section and check the description. We're going to put all of my, the a link to all of Mike's uh, Mike's books. Really appreciate you guys watching. See ya. You know, this whole thing started for me again when I was young and uh, you know, these experiences necessar necessarily that they were alien, right? I don't know exactly what they were, um, but my early experiences happened when I was just a kid and like literally in my room. And, uh, you know, the, the whole th way it started was um, what is kind of like jarring, right? Because the first um, instant I noticed anything was I, I heard um, a voice like, and it's not just like you hear a voice in your head, like where there's a question about it, like you feel it through your entire body. And this is something we can call like a telepathic lock on. So I heard um, he can see us. And, you know, as I heard that, I saw this um, like almost what you can call uh, a shadow entity, but it was um, it was almost scintillating like it had a mild glow to it and, and it collapsed into an orb. Uh, and I was absolutely frightened, you know, cause I'm maybe five or six years old when this is happening, I literally just, um, you know, put the covers over myself and I'm trying to hide that happened maybe a dozen times when I was younger. Um, so because of, and, and other than that, I had uh, spontaneous, what people call out of body experiences, and, you know, back back then, I didn't associate the two together. They just seemed to be different experiences. In, in retrospect, now looking back after I've been involved in the research for so many years, uh, you know, there there actually seems to two all that, like all these experiences. So um, can I ask a question real quick? What, so yeah. when you're five or so old, like, was there any any interaction or contact other than them just saying he can hear he can see us? I heard I heard it was, it's, it's really hard to explain. Um, I heard like, it almost sounds like gibberish, but you could, it, it, it interprets body somehow. I, that's the only way I can say it. You, um, you mentioned the movie, um, the knowing, yeah. The knowing, which was a great movie. Who, whoever, I, I don't think that whoever made that movie just like made that. They either did really, really intricate research or they hadn't experienced themselves because that the way they that whisper happens is, was exactly like I got chills when I saw that movie. And that's the same kind of thing, right? Like we we hear UFO like aliens. Um, but in, and even in that movie, the way it was represented, you know, they had a kind of pinning to it where they were kind of like angelic entities. But that's actually closer to the truth. Uh, say that there aren't uh, what people call extraterrestrial biological entities, meaning like oh these kind of um, like gray figures and the uh, beings that you see with the big heads and the big eyes um, like that. I, I think, you know, I had not seen that directly, uh, but based on all the testimony and the reports out there, I, I do think that is something that's genuine. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to go too far off onto a tangent, but some people speculate that that's like uh, an advanced organic AI, basically. Um, and those, those entities are like, um, you know, created or generated to, to fulfill like missions or wh whatever you want to call it. So, um, but an entity like that, I had not ever seen, um, these entities look more like, again, um, you know, shadow beings or light beings, whatever people want to call them. And again, the orb phenomenon is something that's really apparent, um, that's only being reported more frequently now. It's it's been reported on, it's been discussed, but it's it's really a intricate part of the phenomenon. But again, going going back back then, I didn't necessarily uh, associate the UFO phenomenon because I, I would have experiences like that. And again, spontaneous out of body experiences where I'm just like laying down and and about to go to bed, and it feels like I'm sleeping. Or and and all of a sudden, like I, I I'm looking down at myself, 
And and as soon as you you realize, holy shit, that's that's me. That's my my myself, my body, whatever. You snap right back in and you and kind of wake up. Uh, that's how that happened for me, at least. But it was, uh, you know, many years later, I guess, um, when I was 20 years old in 2007, when I had a series of um, UFO encounters that really, uh, you know, you know, pushed me into the, like no going back. Um, because, you know, the early experiences led me to do, uh, you know, inquiry and research. So even from a young age, I was reading books on UFOs and, and metaphysics. And, you know, at 18, I started doing meditation kind of, um, partially because of martial arts, but more so, um, you know, cause I was like looking in the, in the bookstore and I found books on meditation and stuff like that too. So I'd been meditating for two years by 2007 and, um, the, the 2007 wave of events for me that really, you know, thrust me into this world for keeps and, you know, kind of made it a mission for me to be involved. If I can say it that way, um, it's, it started off really weird. Uh, and in it, a series of events that we would call like synchronicities and high strangeness. And the reason is important is because Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was the official astronomer for the, the U.S. Air Force for Project Blue Book, uh, found that the, the most genuine UFO close encounters that occurred had something what he called high strangeness. And it was, you know, high strangeness is basically – a, a, a type of phenomenon or, or a series of events that are just so, you know, so extreme or outlandish that there's, there's no other way to categorize it other than high strangeness. But this association with high strangeness and close encounters was so strong that he, he made this term to, to, you know, denote that this is something that happened in a lot of close encounters. And, uh, you know, along with Dr. Jalen Hynek was uh, Lay, um, who's an important researcher. So, you know, th these events I would consider high strangeness and started, uh, the, 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 you know, there's kind of three events that really marked this for me that pushed me into this. And the, the first one, you know, I'm, I'm working an overnight shift and, you know, one of my coworkers in the morning before I left the shift, super kind of conservative guy, you know, we talk about like, you know, work co-worker talk right and out of nowhere he said hey did you hear about the ufos in mexico and you know i, I found it really weird that he would even bring the subject up you know? uh because i at that point i you know i had the earlier experiences but i had an interest so for him to say that i'm kind of thinking like what you know where is this coming from uh but i, I brushed it off i figured it's just a coincidence right i drive home and I go to sleep and I worked an overnight shift. So this, you know, by the time I go to sleep, it's like maybe eight 30 in the morning or so. And in my dream, when I go to sleep, I have this insane, uh, kind of like a, you, you can call it a UFO dream. Right. Um, and in the dream I'm, I'm driving, uh, down in my old neighborhood and there's just this, um, like a orange plasma UFO right over my car. And it's a dream, but I'm, I'm like freaking out, you know, um, like it's pulsing with electricity and stuff. And I can hear like the energetic charge and I can feel the sensations in my body. And it's and I'm, I'm freaking out in the dream. I'm just like not thinking. I'm just like, I need to get the hell away from this thing. Um, and, and I'm trying to drive away. Is and this, this is like going a, on from a suburb. I mean, is this some yes, where yes, a suburb, suburb like anybody yeah. could walk out of their house and see this thing? Like it's not well, like yeah, but this is, remember, this is a dream. This is this right now uh, is a is a dream. But, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So yeah, because I know that at some I, point you get in your car. Well, yeah. That's this is this is what sorry. follows. This is the crazy. This is what's so crazy about it, right? Is that you know? So, uh, and I'll I'll round that out for you. So, it, it's a dream, and I'm I'm like driving. I'm trying to get away, and I snap out of the dream, and by the time I wake up, it's maybe like three 30 in the afternoon and it's either late spring or early summer. And somebody, you know, one of my family members walks on my house and the first thing they say to me is, Hey, did you hear about the UFOs in Mexico? 
So I'm like, you know, and this is the high strangeness thing, right? Right. So I'm like, no, screw this. And, you know, the reason I say high strangeness, because there's, there's no, I mean, there's no way in hell that you're going to have the, that series of events take place as a coincidence. Right. Um, you know, and I've spoken to different researchers about it and, you know, I don't know whether that dream was something that the UFO phenomenon basically placed into me, right? Like, did they make me have the dream or was it some kind of cognitive event? Uh, and I don't know the, yeah, I don't know, you know? Right. And, and so when, I, because when I, you know, the family member said that to me and I'm like, okay, screw this. I need to just go. And there's a Chinese place down the street from me that I used to always go to. So I'm like, I'm going to go get some Chinese food and just like relax, you know, cause this is kind of bullshit right now. Um, so I get in my car and it's again, it's three 30 in the afternoon. Maybe it's broad daylight. And I start driving and within a few hundred feet of me driving, I, you know, I'm looking, you know, ahead of me, right. And right in the sky sent right dead center in the sky. There's just a fireball there. And in my mind, I think, Holy shit, that's a UFO. Uh, and as soon as I think that, cause it was, it was stationary. As soon as I think that it starts to move <laughs> and I like, I'm freaking out at this point. Right. And it's, it's like the, the, the fireball in the sky is like amazing. Right. But the really did it for me. The whole, what really hit me so hard was that the series of events that led to it, because the whole thing is an event at this point, it wasn't just, I'm driving and I see this fireball. I had somebody who oddly out of character said something to me about a UFO in the morning, um, UFOs in Mexico. I had this crazy dream and then as soon as I wake up, this family member says something to me, the same thing that this guy said. This UFO. And then and and then I have this daytime sighting of a fire. So the whole thing is what really hit me like a ton of bricks. Uh, I think the, almost that led to it occurring was was almost more insane than having the daytime sighting itself. You know, it's like, it, how do you weigh that out? Um so I, I was, you know, I tried to chase the fireball, you know, it was moving, it was moving across the sky, gliding across silently. Um, I, you know, it, it eventually got out of my sight. I wasn't able to, to keep up with it. Um, it didn't like zoom on anything fantastic, but again, it's just a, a fireball, maybe the size of a dime or a little smaller floating through the sky. I mean, it, it looked, you know, at arm's length, it looked that big, um, I don't know how, how far away it was necessarily, maybe a few thousand feet, uh, but it was still incredible. And, you know, after that event, I was really um, impactful event. So I, at that point, I was even more kind of, you know, driven to look into UFOs as a more, you know, um, as a, as a serious thing, because at this point, um, I'm, I'm being interacted with, right? I didn't ask for this to happen. Uh, the earlier ones either. Um, and again, like I said, the earlier ones, even at this point, I recall those experiences, but I'm not necessarily tying it to UFO at that point. So, you know, skip ahead, maybe two to three months. You know, I don't know the exact time frame, but it was, it was about two to three months. I ended up having this, um, this crazy, you know, I, it's not an NDE because I didn't, uh, but it's something I call, um, you know, a trauma induced out of body experience. So I got into this, um, this car accident and, uh, during, you know, when the accident happened, all of a sudden that, you know, I'm driving and the, the next thing I know the a accident happens and I'm, I'm f like face to face, you know, in, uh, with this, I mean, like a light being right. An entity of light. And how, how uh, did the, how did the accident happen? And like, when, what, when was it and how did it happen? So I was listening to your interview when yeah. I was actually, uh, painting. So I, that's why I think I, I feel like I, I must've won or something. Um, that's why I felt like I, I thought you had come home from work gone to sleep, couldn't sleep, went to leave or, or went to drive around to go to sleep. And that's when you had the accident. But I guess I, I missed something. But so what I'm wondering now is when you had the accident, 
was it in the middle of the night? Were you in a, this, this was actually in the daytime. This is because my was insane. I'm working overnights. And I think at that point I'm working like seven days a week. Okay. And so I fell asleep when I was driving basically. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And, it, and, uh, this was in daylight. This was, but it was similar. Yeah. I, I was, it was in the morning, kind of like not quite, at, not quite noon. Um, but I fell asleep when I was driving and, you know, I didn't realize until afterwards that upside down and, and basically into a building. Is this, um, is this, and this is in the middle of a, a, like a populated area. It's like a suburb. Yeah. Okay. So the, and the crazy thing happened and I didn't realize this really, I didn't really think about this until years later, but this happened exactly like to the T exactly where I saw the fireball, um, sighting craft, whatever okay. you want to call it. Um, and again, I, for whatever reason, I didn't put two to two together, but literally to the T the exact. So, you know, again, when the crash occurs, I guess I have, maybe you can say I have a lapse in consciousness, right? I don't know, but that occurs. And all of a sudden I'm face to face with this, like uh, a light being right. Um, and for, for whatever reason, the first impression that I got when I said T was that it was not separate from myself. Um, and, and again, that's an impression. That's the feeling I had of like in that. And uh, I heard this entire like crystalline orchestra. It's like, you know, it, you know, I guess it, like if you imagine being in heaven or something and hearing that like kind of angelic music, that's, that's what it felt like. Right. And, um, and I'm not, mind you, I'm not like religious in, in a sense, like I, you can say I'm spiritual cause I'm doing meditation and I'm into those kind of subjects, metaphysics or whatever. Um, but not religious. And I, I heard, you know, a voice say, uh, you know, God is all there is, ever was, and ever will be. And, um, you know, I, for whatever, whatever that means. And all of a sudden it fl I, you know, it flipped different, uh, thing, right. Where I saw, <laughs> describe this as much as I want and never comes out exactly how I perceive it, I guess, is that I saw the past, the present, and the future kind of as like one thing. And then right after that, it flipped into me being above the scene of the accident. And I'm looking down at the accident and I can see my car. I see an ambulance. I see the building. I see the street. I see the whole thing. And what's crazy is that the, the my point of view of where I'm looking down was exactly where the fireball was when I had seen it. And again, that's not something I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together. Like that's not something that automatically, I didn't realize that for a year until I was telling um, a researcher, a uh, doctor, one of the stories years later. Um, so that, that event like was, was extremely profound for me because, you know, even though it wasn't like a true near death experience, I, I felt like I had, you know, escaped the claws of death. Basically I was like, wow, like I, I could have died if I did, you know, if I somehow had hit my head the wrong way or whatever. So I, after that occurred, uh, you know, I was just like so grateful even just to be alive at that point and, you know, add on to it, the, the, the experience, right. Um, that I had was, um, you know, I guess transformative in a way, because did when you, you, when you have snap back into your, like, it, you know, you're, you're looking down on yourself. Did you start? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I, when I wake up, I'm in like the ambulance basically. And I'm like, Holy shit, I'm alive. But even when I was looking down at the accident, one of the craziest thing was like, I was conscious, right? Like in my awareness that have been in my body, but I was, aware and it's not like i wasn't being like pulled through the experience where like i wasn't conscious of what's going on because i'm looking down at the accident and i'm like i'm thinking so this is it huh like i think i i'm thinking that i'm dead and i was just to i was totally cool with it like i felt totally at peace just like there wasn't like a regret or a care like oh no totally fine it was like the, t the most blissed out thing equanimity um i i just felt perfectly at peace right and that and then I, I snapped into my body and i'm like oh my god like holy shit i'm alive 
and I'm in the ambulance. Um, so, you know, the next day, uh, you know, cause they want to do MRIs and scans and whatever, make sure I didn't have like internal bleeding and all that. So the day I get home and I'm just like super grateful to be alive. Right. And I'm still like, I, I feel different physically. Right. Like, and I, I hate to use words like this cause it's going to rub people the wrong way, but like energetically. Right. I literally feel different, like a different frequency in my body. If you can say that. Right. Um, but I'm just super grateful to be alive and I'm like just cleaning my room, whatever. And this ends up being the next day at night, both chain of events occurs. And as I'm just in my room or whatever, I hear like, I hear, I don't even, it's not even just like I hear a voice, just like when I was a kid, I hear a voice, but I can feel it through my entire body. Uh, and it says, come outside. But the, the crazy thing about that is, is we'll call it a download, right? Or again, we can say it's a telepathic lock-on. Because as, as soon as I hear the voice, it's not just I, that I hear or I feel the voice. I got like this whole uh, like a package of like information, if you want to call it that. And But what I, what I mean by that is there's like all these sensations. I get like this kundalini experience through my body um, and – and I see these two entities again. This is in my mind that I see it. Like, right, e my eyes are open, and I can even see everything around me like normal. But there's like an overlay um, of these two entities. And you know, I hate to say this because it's it's in the UFO literature, and I, it sounds hokey or whatever. But I saw, you know, I saw, uh, you know, a male and a female in these kind of like almost grayish blue spacesuits, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, what people call Nordics or tall whites or whatever. I, and, um, and I heard that, but I also got these kind of, I guess you can say messages that they're related to us and they want people to know that they're here and all this, you know, and, and I have to, you know, kind of preface this by saying, I don't know if, I don't know if that's true. Right. Um, if, if, if they're related to us and they're here to help us, or I don't know if my mind made that up to try to cope with whatever was going on. I don't know if they actually literally communicated that. And I don't know if they actually, actually literally catered that. And that means it's true, right? It could still be a deception of some kind or, you know, in, in my own sense, it felt as genuine and as ever. And, and while this is going on, I'm not even questioning it. I I'm taking it literally. Um, so again, it said come outside. Right. And as soon as I heard that instantly, like the, I, there was no second thing, I just ran outside and I get out, I get out the door and I get, there's some, like tree coverage over there over when you walk out the door. So I get past that and I look up and I, you know, even before I'm looking up, I hear this, this hum of this, uh, you know, what I end up seeing is a, like a, a craft that's almost like a hexagon and it's like vroom 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 and i can feel the pulsing um when it's when it's making that noise and i have this again this almost like a kundalini experience of energy and electricity throughout my entire and it, it felt like my awareness was connected to their awareness if i can say that and like i was feeling that their state the state of being that they're in i could feel uh and it was the super elating uh like i felt you know, super blissful, I guess, if you, if I can say that. And again, it's, it, this, this craft is, must be like a hundred feet in the air and it's shaped like a, like a hexagon, almost like a, like a dark metal. If I can say that it wasn't, it wasn't black, like black matte blackout, but it was like a very, very dark gray and almost seamless. And there were like, there was a perfectly square white center and around it there were just lights going around like this like um you know yellow blue purple red green the whole thing and i'm kind of it's above me kind of just gliding across and i'm trying to i'm going down into my driveway i get down into my driveway and i'm waiting for a few seconds and then instantaneously you know while i'm looking at it 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 you know, you can say it dematerializes, it disappears, it appears 
about a thousand feet away or 1500 feet away over this, this man-made lake that's there. And it, it just reappears there. And it's just, you know, slowly moving and it's got the lights moving around it. And once my, once I'm looking at it over there, my focus is over there. I can see that there are two other, um, crafts just like that. And, you know, about the same distance away and they're all kind of moving around slowly in the sky. And at, at this point, I'm, I'm, really thinking like, am I, am I hallucinating at this point? Like, did I hit my head so hard in that accent that I'm just imagining this because this is uh, over the top. This is over the top now. And I'm kind of freaking out. So I ran into my house and, you know, two of my family members there, <laughs> guys, um, they're here. Or, or I said, you got to come outside. And, there's, and they say, why? I say, they're here. And they said, who's here? I said, just come outside. So my two family members come outside and they they see these crafts just moving around with the you know the lights spinning around and everything, and this is going on you know they're just like you know they're they're witnessing and they don't know what to make of it, and uh, you know so after maybe like twenty minutes or so of, of watching this and and while I'm watching this like I'm thinking in my head that the whole world knows that this is going on I'm like because this is it's a suburb area right. So right. I'm thinking that everybody is seeing this. Like, there's no question in my mind. And I'm thinking like the, the whole world's going to know about, um, you, know, you know, UFOs. And at that point, what I was terrestrials, but, and, you know, in retrospect now, after a lot of research and thinking, I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's as, as simple and straightforward as that. But I'm thinking that the, the next day that this is going to be like the whole world's going to know that, you know, these beings are here and, and everything. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole way that this, this event ended was by, you know, I, you know, I hadn't paid attention to where the third one was, but there's the, there's two of them, two of these crafts left and the lights are spinning and everything. And they're, they're going towards each other like this. And as soon as I'm thinking like, oh, they're going to, they're going to freaking crash, right? They're going to uh, made contact like this. They just both vanished. And the sky was empty and quiet and I was, you know, and that was, that was the end of it. Right. And I'm just, uh, I was amazed because I'm, I'm still trying to take the whole thing in, you know, when it ended, when it ended, I'm, I'm like, holy shit. Like what, what just happened? You know, why did this happen? And, and, you know, that's what led me on the journey of creating, engaging the phenomenon, uh, you know, which is my YouTube and podcast. I mean, I, I made it, this happen. this all happened in 2007, but, you know, in, and being actively involved in the UFO research community and speaking to different researchers um, is what led me to create engaging the phenomenon. But <clears throat> I got the impression from this contact, these, con these, you know, series of contact experiences that, you know, people, the, the, the entities themselves, again, they communicated whether, whether it was literally or as a deception or whether my mind some somehow tried to create a reason for it to happen or something is that I, I, I got the impression that, you know, the intelligence wanted people to know that they were here. And, and again, you know, they said they were related to us. I don't know if that's true. Um, but I, I, you know, wanted people to know that this was all real because now I had these experiences and I know for a fact that uh, this is something that's genuine. So I felt compelled to get involved in the research community publicly at that point and to share information. Um, but I also realized that I can't like I can't just tell somebody about this experience. Right. Like I, I can tell somebody, but it's, it's not going to have the impact you know, you're not, it's not, you're not going to have that switch go off in your head unless you have this kind of experience, right? Like even if, even if, um, you're convinced UFOs are real, you know, having a direct experience like that is going to, is going to just, it's going to change you, right? It's going to, it's going to transform your worldview. The way you see yourself, the way you look at the universe, because all, you know, all of a sudden within a few, you have to reconsider everything that you thought you knew was true. And you're like, holy shit, if this, if this is true, 
you know, what, what else did I get? What else is true that, that I'm not quite sure about. Right. Um, so it has that kind of like paradigm shift and it opens your awareness up to so much. Well, isn't this is also like the first time that was the first time that you actually, you know, you, you know, it's not in your head, like your, your family members came out and saw it. So it's like, okay, so this isn't just me. I actually have someone that, so you guys are seeing this. Yes. Okay, yeah, good. Physical. Well, then I know it's not. Yeah, it's a phys- physical crafts, like, right. you know, um, I mean, the fireball convinced me, right? But this, again, this was just on another level um, for several different reasons. Again, because I had the telepathic lock on thing, but again, I this is my family out and see this. And it wasn't just like with the fireball, it was like a minute kind of looking at it and it's out of the, my way. This is going on 20 minutes and I'm, you know, and we're a physical craft with the hum and everything. Um, so, at that point, I started really active, like very dedicating myself, almost like a life mission to research and and, and trying to share information. Um, it was at that point that I found CE5 or Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, um, which, you know, for people to understand, you know, there's a close encounter scale, um, you know, close of the first, second and third kind, which were created by Dr. J. Allen Hynek as a way to uh, categorize and classify um, close encounters um, when he was part of Project Blue Book. So encounter the first kind is seeing a craft, you know, within 500 feet, it says, but but really a close encounter of the first kind is like you see a craft close enough to determine it's an actual UFO, basically. Right. Uh, a close encounter of the second kind is that a, a UFO leaves some kind of trace, Right whether it's, uh, you know, uh, like a, a radiation trace, it's tracked on radar, it's, it's recorded on video or picture somehow, you know, there's some kind of trace that you can attribute to the UFO. Um, and then a closer encounter of the third kind is if you have like a, if you see an entity, right? If you see an occupant of a UFO, like in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, that was uh, done by Steven Spielberg, that you know, that's a close encounter of the third kind. A close encounter of the fourth kind, which which Dr. Jalen Heineck did not create, somebody added to the scale, is when somebody has an onboard experience or an abduction experience. And then uh, Dr. Stephen Greer created the term of the fifth kind, and there are different levels to it, but more commonly, it's known as a human initiated contact, where you intentionally go out to do a uh, you know to have an encounter you invite the encounter to happen and and one occurs um and there's there's two uh, there's two degrees of that i say because if somebody is just watching a uf you know they're they're out whatever and they're looking at the sky or or whatever it is and they see a ufo and it's just moving along they just randomly see and they think to it like or like oh my god i wish it would come closer and all of a sudden, the UFO stops and starts to come closer. It seems that there's some kind of telepathic connection or, or mental connection, whatever. Um, that's that's a CE five of the second degree, um, you know, according to Dr. Stephen Greer's category. But a, of the of the fifth kind, first degree is when you go out and you do what's called the CE five protocols, or you know, you go out and you intentionally invite a UFO encounter, and one appears. That's a close encounter of the fifth kind, first degree. That's that's when people say CE five. That's more most generally what they're talking about. And Dr. Stephen Greer created protocols to have that kind of encounter. Um, but I I want to preface that a little by saying you know I found Dr. Stephen Greer because I'm crazy doing research at this point. Like all you know all my free time I'm doing I'm doing like research and meditation basically, um, and. I see this press conference on YouTube and it's this random doctor, right? Uh, and a bunch of military witnesses talking, you know, in Washington, DC at the national press club about their firsthand encounter while serving in the government with UFOs or UFO related information or the UFO cover up. So I bet there's about 12 witnesses and they're all sharing their testimony, highly credible people with credentials that could be vetted, um, 
you know, sharing their their testimony in Washington, D.C. about their firsthand knowledge of UFOs and UFO cover up. And, you know, what was weird to me is just like the whole thing was hosted by this, this is kind of random doctor. There's all this military people. And I'm thinking, who the hell is this doctor? Right. Why is why do you a doctor hosting this event with all these military people? Like, why is it not like a colonel or general or something like right. that? This guy. And I start looking into all his work. And that's when I found CE5. Because he, I go where he's talking about contact. And what struck me when I'm watching his video is that the way he's describing contact and how it occurs was exactly how I had experienced it. And there are, there are just like small, subtle details that he's explaining that you, you couldn't just make up, right? The only details were if you experienced it from yourself, you know? So that's what struck me of that. What he's talking about is authentic. So, okay. I, I started researching all his work. I read his books and uh, and I'm, you know, he has guided guided practices for what he calls the CE five protocols, and um, you know, th- just just to clarify too, there are other groups who did so- similar things, mm-hmm. and in earlier years, but um, this is what I came across first, and so I started doing the the CE five protocols, and I I got responses right that it was working. It it wasn't like the experiences that I had when it was just kind of like they spontaneously happened to me. It wasn't on that level of, um, you know, impact, I guess you want to say, or it wasn't as crazy or dramatic, but sure enough, you, if you go out, you do the protocols, which, um, you know, to do a quick overview of the, this, what's known as the C5, CE5 protocols is you basically do some kind of meditation where you're going to get in a calm and tranquil state and then you used what is what's called remote viewing, you know, which in remote viewing, look up the, the CIA's program, Project Stargate, and, and how the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense both studied and utilized remote viewing, which is basically being able to use your consciousness to see a distant time or, or, or space, right? And, and the government was using this to gain intelligence and they got some pretty serious hits when they did it, like meaning they were able to acquire certain information that could have not otherwise been known. And that project for 22 years. Um, but anyways, so you're, you're doing meditation and, and what people, you know, you can call remote viewing. If you don't believe you can remote view, you can do like an, uh, a kind of visualization of, um, you know, seeing uh, some kind of UFO or or an ET craft, as as Dr. Greer would say, um, in deep space or around the Earth or wh- wherever, and you're using kind of like a visual a visualization or remote viewing vector to draw them back to your location like in a in a seamless sequence, and that's what he calls coherent thought sequencing, which is is part of the C five protocol. And, you know, sure enough, if you practice anything um, enough, you're going to get good at it and it becomes more automatic. You don't have to sit there and intentionally becomes less mechanical. Um, So when you you get pretty good at the process eventually over time and, you know, again, you do it enough times, you're it's like, you know, throwing at a target a thousand times. Eventually you're going to hit the bullseye. So I was doing I was doing this on, uh, you know, a, a very regular basis, probably more than I should have because I was so impacted by the other encounters. And I was also thinking, like, why didn't I think of that? Right. Like it's so like if I was having these encounters and having this kind of direct um, mental or telepathic connection, like why wouldn't I think to um, sure enough? I got pretty good at it and I, I was able to have regular responses, right? Which could vary in all different types of ways. Um, some could be more dramatic or some can just see, you see a light in the sky that will stop and then move in another direction and, and more fl- flashes of lights or, you know, a, a more kind of extreme, but elusive cases. If you have like an orb, come down into your yard or where the location you're at. Mm-hmm. And for people who want a small example of this, there was just a history channel episode of uh, beyond skinwalker where they go over the Chris Bledsoe case. And that's a case that has been investigated by NASA and the CIA and the DOD. And they were highly interested in his case. And um, 
he has it's so because of that it's been documented fairly well where you have somebody from cia on property or somebody from the army intelligence on property and even they're baffled by some of the anomalies that are going on right and you know so the so the people understand you know uh ufo encounters or you know encounters with now what they call it uap unidentified anomalous phenomena it's not with the movies so you can have be having different um anomalous phenomena occur and it's it's not like what you see in a movie right it's going to be stranger than that uh and more bizarre and and harder to define right that's what makes it anomalous and you know a lot of people in the older ufo research field have a hard time coming to grips with that because they want us to be seen as, as credible and scientific. So if you're not talking about a metal ship in the sky, they kind of get a little hesitant to discuss it, even if they know that's the core of the, the work and the research and what's being reported. And, and, you know, nowadays it's more accepted in the research community because it's been investigated by the Department of Defense in, in, in a program that was called OSAP, um, and, uh, and which later became ATIP, which is what came out in the, 2017 uh new york times story and it, and it came out that you know robert bigelow was contracted and created this government program with the di uh, dod and the dia with all these really really top level scientists like home kelleher dr Eric davis dr hal Putoff, and you know dr hal Putoff was involved with that project stargate remote viewing program and uh dr kit green and, and jacques valet and all these other really highly regarded scientists the the remote i remember seeing something on the remote viewing back in the late 80s early 90s when during the cold war probably in the height of the cold war where they were having people that were that supposedly could do remote viewing and they were trying to have them place themselves in soviet military facilities yeah. right like it started at military absolutely or military applications and you know where they wanted them to can you go into this building can you and they would come back and say that they'd looked in, you know, this room or that room or tried to go into a file cabinet, but couldn't do it. Or well, was, uh, it was interesting because there was, what was interesting was they would be able to describe buildings. Yeah. And well, the inside, the outside where they were, when there was no way these people would know where these buildings right, were. Right. Or, and or what you know, they looked like or anything. And there's an incident with, you know, a classified Soviet, submarine where it's no way it should have been there and and you know these guys were able to track that and it was accurate intelligence and and when they're given the remote viewing of the coordinates they're not telling him what to look for right and the coordinates are not a longitude latitude it's just a number that represents a target and so they didn't even the the, the viewer that that got the hit didn't even know what the intelligence community was looking for and sure enough he got this insane insanely accurate hit which was actionable intelligence they could now take this intelligent and act on it strategically right, right? they didn't have the brand for 20 years because it didn't work right, right. or they it may not have results. been per right you know it may not have been perfect but if they could use it operationally that's why the program continued and i'm going to argue uh, that it, it still continued to this day, and it's just been stovepiped and hidden away and compartmentalized and moved, basically. Right. I was gonna say, well, listen, if the if the Department of you know if the Department of Defense can consistently lose hundreds of billions of dollars, then they can be running other programs without anybody knowing, you know, off the books that nobody's in charge of. So. Right. Well, and that's how that's how the UFO programs have been kept. What's called unacknowledged special access programs, or or waived special access programs, or controlled access programs. And uh, you know the 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 you know the big issue with the secrecy is how has the secrecy been kept? And it's it's because people in charge haven't been in the loop, right? Congress and the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate. They haven't been kept up to date on this. They're they're blocked out of the programs, and that's why now now we're seeing the public reaction from all this. Yeah, I was, you know the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking was the the descriptions, like you're saying that when people are describing these events, and you know they're 
you know, whatever uh, operation, you know, blue book or, you know, whatever, whatever the people that are going out kind of collecting this information to do these investigations are kind of blowing off anybody that doesn't specifically state it was a craft. It was clearly a craft, but the problem is, is that, you know, they're looking at a, like you said, a very tangible, you know, this must be a craft. This must be like a ship. This must be, but the truth is, because that's what that's just how they're conceptualizing. This is the only thing it could be. But the the problem is, if you could communicate with an ape what's happening and, and ask an ape how to describe what's happening in the zoo or in the jungle or with humans, or they would never be able to describe it. They would describe it in a very rudimentary way to the best of their abilities. Because the truth is, they don't really understand what that vehicle is. They don't know what a bus is, what a plane is. They don't know where this would have to describe it in the limited, you know, cap- with their limited capabilities. So they're, you're, they're going to get a very, very rudimentary explanation of what's happening. So for us to sit here and try and conceptualize what we're seeing, like, you know, we have a limited vocabulary, a limited understanding, and we're seeing things. And, you know, just like you said, like, you don't really know what you're seeing. You don't roll right, out. Just like right. what I what I like is that you're like, you know, I'm not even saying that I necessarily even know, you know, are these really people that are beings from another dimension that are telling the truth? Are they really aliens? Are they really like I don't know? Here's what happened. Here's what I saw. Who knows? Did, did you ever see that movie? Um. Uh, they. They. I'm oh, not listen. sure. I'm going to send you the, listen, it, it's, is it's it a, they, or they live? Is it, they live? Yeah. Well, I think no, it's, there's the older one. They live with Roddy Piper. Yes. 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 Oh yeah. A yeah. B movie. I love yeah. that. What I loved was that it was everywhere. They were. Yes. yes. You just didn't know. You know, they're, they're supposed to be making a follow-up uh, Netflix series or something to that. Oh man. What? Wow. John Carpenter. That yeah. Be? I hope so. You know, that was, that was a great, that was a great, cause he puts on those glasses and you realize like, oh, wow, we're, we're just like, we're like clueless Disney yeah. world. Yeah. And we have for, for these beings. Well, and, our lives. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up for uh, several accounts is number one is like, yeah, like we, we see a UFO and we think, we think we're so smart and we know what it is. Right. And like, just as an example, right? So crash retrievals are a big subject now. David Grush, uh, who is a highly credible former intelligence officer, has come forward. Um, you know, he put an intelligence community inspector general complaint about how this issue is being mishandled and, and illegally hidden um, from Congress and oversight about crash retrievals. Um, and that happened in the, the UFO or UAP hearing that happened a few weeks ago in Congress by the Oversight Committee. But just, let's just say all that's true, right? Let's say that we, you know, Roswell is real and, and there's a few other incidents that occurred that are, that are real. And we have these craft and we even have bodies. That doesn't mean we know where they're from. That right. does not mean we know where they're from or even what they are. Right. right, or you could even conceptualize where they're from, or what dimension, or what planet. Right, or right. What. If something was from another dimension, how would we even know? Right. We, right. I was gonna say my argument is always, um, because I I have a friend that you know I, I don't want to say he's a, he's you know an enthusiast, but the problem with him is that he believes in every conspiracy that has ever b- been, like I mean well, from. Bigfoot to the Loch Ness monster to JFK to I mean you name a conspiracy he believes them all. So, but one of the things I always argue with him about is, you know, is that you know why would they be here? Yeah. Like, what do we have that they don't need? There's nothing like if you could travel billions of light years or be an interdimensional species. There's nothing we offer. Well, yeah, and so there's 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 really great uh, thinking on that, right? Like number one is who says they're not from here, right? Because it, as far and Jacques Vallee wrote a book to Magonia, and um, and there's been good uh, there's a book called The Crypto Terrestrials by Mac Tons for people who are in, in, interested in looking at these kind of ideas. Is that you know number one, 
let's just say they're from another dimension, but they coexist in the same space, right? Like they're from earth. They're just shifted in a slightly different frequency or dimension. And, you know, and either intentionally or unintentionally, they're, they're coming in and out somehow, right? Maybe their technology is just so advanced. They can interface with our dimension or frequency. And maybe there's certain spots on the earth where the, that wall between dimensions is thinner, like what people argue for like Skinwalker Ranch and Mount Shasta and, and those kind of, you know, Catalina Island um, and these other areas where there's high activity, right? Um, or, you know, there's, you know, Dr. Hal Putoff, who was, you know, you know, helping uh, with that remote viewing program, wrote, wrote a paper called the ultra terrest the ultra terrestrials, which is hy a hypothesis for, you know, maybe w the origin of, of the UFO intelligence, what some of the possibilities are. And, you know, Mac Tani's crypto terrestrials are saying, actually, you know, they they could have been here the whole time and they're just making us think that they're from space. So we're looking out there and really the whole time, you know, they have been coexisting with us for thousands of years in some kind of hidden way, whether they're using technology to mask themselves or their lotions, because there's way it's, you know, Richard Dolan's coming out with a book called the USOs, right? But all these Navy encounters are by the water, right? Yeah, there's way more uh, surface or coverage underneath the ocean than there is. We know less about about the ocean than space, you know. Right, right. And I... so, if they have, if they are so advanced in technology, and they're able to somehow hide in the water, or maybe they, maybe they're a civilization that came here thousands of years ago that just have an outpost. Did you see the movie here. The Abyss? I did not. I, I my friend watched it. I got to get around to it. Yeah, it just comes out of nowhere when when you see the whole movie and at the ending it's like, wow, like it, like this is, not, I didn't see it coming. Yeah. You, um. So it, it it just turns out that they're, you know, the ocean bed is just that's where they're living. There's massive, massive cities, yeah, down there that we just don't have any idea, and the only reason they even make contact is because we're kind of exploring the abyss. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, we better uh, go ahead. Okay, we better yeah, go well, ahead and see you what's know, up. And and you know, I didn't I didn't read the book yet, but there's something called Chains of the Sea, and uh, apparently it's kind of tied to that kind of idea. And uh, you know, one of the people who poured as a you know a theoretical was was Lou Elizondo, right? And that's the intelligence officer that uh, counterintelligence officer that came out and you know spoke to the New York Times and disclosed the the program ATIP you know, advanced aerospace threat identification program. So it's not just like UFO researchers are speculating. There's also people that are in the intelligence community that are also proposing some of these kind of ideas. Um, you know, when you said like kind of that they're, well, I, I was thinking about interstellar. So I guess you didn't say this. I was thinking about interstellar. Did you see the, you saw interstellar, right? Yeah. 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 That was great. But what was great was. is that it was, it was like this isn't an alien speech. This is just us, right? You know, communicating. These are well, what fourth, fifth dimension, or uh, us in the future, living in different dimensions. Yeah. And then I was actually talking to my buddy the other day because I'd watched a program on Mars, and I'm, I'm always watching stuff. I was playing stuff in the background, and I just while I was listening to it, they were about how in the future they said once we're you know, an interplanetary species and humans are being born on Mars. They said, we'll become a two species race Yeah, where they said, because think about it. They said they won't need, they'll be taller, thinner, less bone density, less muscle mass, you know? So all of these things you know, that they were saying that, you know, 2000 years in the future, Martians, humans, that Martian species will look so vastly different from us even though they're human right that they would they would essentially be aliens to us and if right. they were to, you know what i'm saying and, and what happens what happens in the evolution of that species yeah right that super like that to me i felt like wow you know that kind of plays into the whole inter um interstellar the you know who knows yeah and there's the, and see these are the types of like lines of thinking we need to be exploring you know for the past like you know, however many years, most UFO researchers 
and and people that are just like watching ufo movies or you know alien movies or whatever you know that we almost had like an automatic assumption in our mind that oh it's aliens from another planet or from another place in space when really it could be something that we we can't even comprehend or think of or haven't thought of yet and you know what you're you know there's a, a guy named doc Dr. Michael Masters, and I th he's uh, I think he's an ev evolutionary biologist uh, professor, and you know he has a theory called the extra tempestrials, which is saying like they're basically time travelers, and it's uh, you know this could be us like a hundred thousand years in the future coming back, and that would explain why they're somehow not the same as us but similar, like right. the uh, the chances and the odds that they would have a head, two arms, two legs. But that is reported so so freely in the and all the literature of UFOs and contact literature and experiencer literature. And, and, they, and they want so they want such limited contact with us. Like you don't want to alter the future. Right, right. You know? And also, you know, for you know, pe you know, people who report that there's DNA taken and stuff, you know, things like that. Like, why would you know? So those ideas I think are, are a good direction rather than just assuming that they're just extraterrestrials from outer space. I mean, however, I, I still think that the, what the ETI, the extraterrestrial or the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is, you know, we should still keep that on the table. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, based on encounters that I've had, uh, you know, the ones that just happened to me and, and during CE5, because I've done the CE5 stuff, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times over thousands of hours and, and interactions or what have you. I don't I don't think it's all the same intelligence that's responsible for what we call UFOs or UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena. It seems that there's different things that are going on. You know, um, you know, people report different types of entities and, you know, even in stories of like crash retrievals and, you know, there's there's different types of crafts that are sometimes reported. You know, sometimes there's a triangle, sometimes there's a disc, sometimes there's a cigar shaped object. Sometimes there's a, what we call a craft or vehicle or plasma. You know, there's all these different um, signatures. So I don't I don't think that we're we're dealing with all of the same intelligence necessarily. Yeah, I've, I have no problem with believe with uh, i'm totally okay with knowing or, or understanding the fact that i have no idea what's really happening you know right. i can i can look at my cell phone and a and a vehicle and tell you i don't know how it works right right vehicles are magic my cell phone is it's a, it's a little box of magic yes you know so i have no <laughs> i have no you know i i have no problem admitting that look i don't know what's happening here you know, like I right. don't, it doesn't, I don't have to know. Like, I understand this is beyond my understanding. Um, yeah. and I was just, I was thinking like, you know, you know, that I, I will watch a program where they were saying, look, these things have been cited forever. And then right. even if let, let's assume that the Roswell crash was real, right. you know, so there's a real craft that was, you know, captured and, and maybe, in the, and there's a few other instances and maybe, maybe actual, um, you know, if they're aliens have been actually captured. You know why it's always like, well, why wouldn't they tell us? Well, in the 1950s, like if you had told the civilization that there were aliens, most of civilization is being still being held together by religious beliefs. Yeah, that would have fundamentally changed. But if you slowly leak these things out and change the consciousness of you know the global consciousness it's because it's not like it's just happening here this is everywhere we're yeah. slowly leaking it out and then you get to a point where you say okay i think they're ready because let's face it when those tapes came out from the uh from the um the navy and that to me was the first 100 percent concrete yeah right evidence do you know that didn't do anything to me Right. Like I right, didn't change right. anything for me. Yeah. I listen, after I heard that, I still went to church on Sunday with yeah. you know with my wife. We still sat there. I still listened. I still got in my car. I, I was like, that's crazy. Did yeah. you hear about the tapes? Did yeah. you watch that thing? Like I'm talking to my buddies about it. We're like, what what's going on? What's going on? It didn't fundamentally make me decide I'm gonna stop paying my bills right. and I'm gonna run around and become a, a maniac because there's no heaven. 
Like I didn't, that wasn't, wasn't what entered my mind. It was just like, it, I had been so inundated by it over the last 40 or, you know, 50 years that I was like, I kind of fucking, I kind of knew that anyway. Yeah. This is yeah. proof, but I kind of felt like it was pretty, there was probably pretty true anyway. Now I've got proof that it's true. So I'm good with it. It didn't change anything, but I think in the forties or fifties, I think it may have, may right. have really done some damage. Yeah. And, you know, they did a study back in the late fifties, early sixties called the Brookings Institute study. And they, you know, they determined that if they would have disclosed this kind of idea to the public at that time, that it would have been catastrophic. And, well, you know, what I, happened when Orson Welles did the program saying that we were being, yeah, 1938, people, right? Yeah. Right. Like if you took War that the in a test run, yeah. people went nuts. Yeah. 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 So. I mean, the way it was presented was kind of jarring too. It wasn't just like, hey, there's aliens or there's no, extraterrestrials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, the, it yeah. was like, we're being invaded. It was like, you know, quick. So, so, so go buy stuff in the grocery store to live for the next, you know, three apparently, months. Apparently, I think back then toilet paper would have been disappearing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, so. Yeah, I think, you know, there there have been people. So the, the cover up back then was probably, again, I don't want to say justified necessarily because, you know, we're a democracy and you have to ultimately come to a vote or a debate. But, may, you know, I could definitely see why back then where they were like, we, you know, especially you got the Cold War going on, a World War Two, like you don't want to upset things worse than they are. Like we're not even sure that we're on a track where we're not going to nuke ourselves right 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 mutually assured destruction and maybe they don't even really know what to say right and and maybe this is our ticket to ensure that we're going to be ahead of the access uh, you know ahead of you know for adversaries like this right. is our one guarantee that we will we will have technology that can outdo our, our adversaries in in a cold war right right like you don't want to you don't want to telegraph that so i mean the strategic purposes why, especially back then, why it would have been so safely guarded, um, you know, because, you know, we had atomic weapons and we know that the Soviets had, uh, uh, you know, atomic capabilities. And so, we, you know, they, that kind of, to some extent, lost our edge in that case. But, you know, this is a sure thing that we're going to have something that we can kind of glean off technologically and, and stay ahead. Um, so do you think, real, sorry, were you done with your thought? Um, I was going to go somewhere else, but uh, by all means, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, do you think that, that, that the United States, like, do you think that those got like the, the, the Navy where they, not the, you know, the Navy pilots where they, you know, they released the video and it, do you think that that was done purposely? Like, Hey, let's go ahead and start start slipping this stuff into the okay. record. So or, by, or, by some, by somebody, it was done intentionally. I mean, there's a whole course of actions that took place to make sure that those tapes came out and they came out in a way that could not be contested. And that was done by, you know, Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo and, and a few others understand. So, the, you know, let's just say that there's a, there's a, a secrecy group, right. That has been covering this up. Right. People call it Majestic or Majestic 12, you know, whatever, majority committee. So if there was a group like that, not everybody is on the same page. There, Some of them are from different religious backgrounds, uh, moral backgrounds. Some of them are more power hungry. Some of them are more democratic in their thinking. And they, they're not all on the same page, right? And so maybe some of them for decades have been trying to leak some of this information out. Uh, in different ways that were safe for them to do so, even though for them it was kind of risky, but it wasn't like, you know, they're putting their lives in jeopardy necessarily, but they're still getting information out to the public little by little and giving them breadcrumbs. Um, you know, again, amidst psychological operations against the American people, there, there, there are disinformation campaigns and there have been, and, you know, David crush testified to that as well, but, you know, so maybe, maybe within that, uh, that group of that's keeping the secret, you know, some of them are some been in that group were dying off and new people are coming in and taking on the, the roles and uh, enough of them have, have wanted transparency that 
they've been able to make bolder moves. And now, now that the toothpaste, they have gained that momentum, they can go ahead and, and, and put out as much as they, they think is safe to do it. Right. Like they're not put out a plan to uh, how to create a UFO. Right. But maybe, maybe the greater portion of, of the secrecy group, they, they want people to know that it's time for, for a few reasons to, for the people of the earth to know that we're not alone. There's another intelligence here and that we have this technology, right? Um, so I think kind of that's that there are these different, you know, like factions within this group and that, you know, the, the group, the, the portion of it that wants transparency has, has gained enough momentum now to, to put out what they think is safe to put out without, um, kind of putting national security at risk, right? We're, they're still able to put out general information to some extent, uh, you know, and, and part of, you know, again, this is speculation. What some people in the intelligence community have said is that, you know, we have these crafts, right, from crash retrievals, and we cannot make make sense of it, right? We can only make so much progress, right? Like you had Philip Corso who wrote the book The Day After Roswell, and, you know, he was a colonel and allegedly he was in charge of some of the technology and giving it to private industry, P small pieces to different uh, companies within the indus industry. You know, this his his testimony goes back to the 1960s, saying that they gave like one little fragment to this company, another fragment to this company. So and, and they didn't tell him it's, it's where it's from. Right. Uh, they said, you know, this is um, foreign materials. Just try to figure out what it does, how we can recreate it, or what we can do with it. And back, so back starting at least in the 50s and 60s, we started to reverse engineer some of the technology that we can make sense of. But um, And that's how we got like, again, this is highly controversial, but, uh, you know, they, they – the testimony will say that's how we got, uh, you know, fiber optics, lasers, and uh, – integrated circuits and like computer chips and stuff like that, you know, and, ha and how technology kind of boomed and blew, took off really at, at that time period. Uh, and not that we weren't working on some stuff like that already a little bit, but it augmented greatly what we were doing and, 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 and made us kind of create technology way faster than we would have. Uh, but, you know, other people argue too, that there's some parts of the technology that there's, we we're, we just can't, we don't know what to do with it. We're just not, we're not break because, because the programs are so compartmentalized and so secret and they're so siloed that you can't have big teams of people working on it and it's, it's delaying our progress. Right. And allegedly the other, other countries like Russia and China and maybe Korea or whoever that have at least, parts of this technology too and maybe they have more people working on it and and if you start making breakthroughs in this kind of technology you're gonna you're gonna far exceed other other countries capabilities and that's that's a national security risk so now you have the secrecy of ufos creating a national security risk right right so if you publicly disclose the general idea that we're not alone there are advanced technologies and intelligences that have been interacting with humanity. And we have some of the three you can create, you can begin to make pathways for programs that can more efficiently and effectively work on the technology, get more brighter people and brighter minds on it, working on it together. So we can make those breakthroughs because we've hit a wall. Yeah. I can only imagine the, the, secrecy that would be surrounding something like this like you you're right you can't you can't have a large group of people working on it at the same time oh, look what happened with the manhattan project i mean the soviets right. which we and we know of, that yeah they're 20 they're 30 years behind us <laughs> not yeah. not when they've got people inside the manhattan but you know right. project giving them information so yeah so i'm sure that was a that was a hard obviously that was a hard lesson to learn you were 20 to 30 years ahead of your, you know, ahead of your, um, competition. And five years later, they're setting off or, you know, there are shoot two or three years later, they're setting off their own nukes. Yeah. The scientist, um, named Dr. Davis, you know, he, he, you know, there's a way, you know, every few years they look at the technology, they have, a, they, 
have a program that tries to reverse engineer the technology and if they can make sense of it at the time or if they found new sciences that can make more advances they do what they can and then once they hit a wall again they put it away for another few years until scientists come up more and evolve more and be, and we can revisit that technology with the advances we made and try to make more out of it um, but that that was creating a problem because we're not moving with it fast enough and we have potential adversaries that could be making advances. Um, but with that, you know, I, I want to mention uh, the Wilson Davis notes uh, because it, it's, again, it's highly, um, you know, relevant to this conversation and, and the testimony of, of David Grush who was talking about UFO crash retrievals and UFO um, reverse engineering programs, or what I think he called, you know, exploitation programs. And because, you know, you had the scientist, Dr. Eric Davis, who's actually ended up working for that, you know, because this, this uh, meeting he had with an admiral, this guy, Admiral Tom Wilson, uh, you know, it, this goes back a few years because, and it goes back to goes back to Dr. Stephen Greer, believe it or not. But let me go back there real quick. Is so in 1997, Dr. Stephen Greer had a meeting in the Pentagon with um, Vice Admiral Tom Wilson, who at the time was the Deputy DIA Director, and he brought with him the astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon, and he brought with him a, a Navy commander who helped set the meeting up, uh, Commander Will Miller, and. Dr. Greer brought some documents with him and and some information to Tom Wilson and the Pentagon to say, hey, you know, we need your help. You have these secret programs, these UMs, and here's a bunch of information basically on why them. So uh, and allegedly, according to the story, Dr. Greer has this NRO um, document. And, you know, again, according to Dr. Greer's testimony, on the document, there's like code names, code numbers. Tom Wilson, Admiral Vice Admiral Tom Wilson, recognizes some of some of these programs because he's he's also joint staff at that point. So that all this stuff is supposed to be under his command, basically. And he's like, wait, you know, he notices he he recognizes a few of the program names and numbers. So he goes ahead and he contacts them, right? And he he speaks to. Uh, somebody in the program and they say, who you are, um, Admiral Tom Wilson, you read into these programs. You don't have access. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm J2. I'm the deputy DIA director. I should be running these programs. You don't, you're not telling me that I don't have access to them. I'll, you know, so he went through chain of command. He went to the special access, um, um, special access went through his channels and he's a big gorilla in at this point. Right. Um, and he, again, like technically, probably he should have had oversight over these programs if these programs were run the way they were supposed to. But because they're clandestine and they're uh, black programs, he was he was basically blocked out. And, um, you know, people went on to vet this meeting, like Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, um, confirmed that the meeting happened. And um, so, you know, and then, you know, we find out in two that you know, in two thousand two, Dr. Eric Davis, who ended up being part of that OSAP and ATIP program, he's a scientist, uh, worked on classified programs with the Air Force. He worked with uh, Bigelow Airspace, and uh, you know, highly intelligent guy. He ends up getting a meeting with Tom Wilson in two thousand two, and you know, to to talk about these UFO programs, and you know. Dr. Eric Davis took notes during this meeting he had with Tom Wilson and those notes leaked. And um, if you look up the um, Wilson Davis notes, you'll see the notes and you'll get, you'll see the discussion that they had, but basically, you know, what, what vice Admiral Tom Wilson discloses in that, in the notes and in the meeting is that he found that the program, he found like two or three programs and he was able to get a hold of, um, somebody from one of the programs and they invited him to come, to come visit and speak with them. And he ends up getting a, a program or a project manager, the, the program security officer and, and a corporate lawyer. So they tell him like, you know, the reason that 
they they had the meeting with him is because they wanted to f- know how he found out about the program because they had almost been uh, uncovered and they almost were because of an audit several years before. Um, and it, you know, if they're found out they're in deep, you know, they're in trouble because they're, they're basically running a, a black program, which technically could be illegal, but it, it's also partially kind of, Those I don't want to say government audits. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, they they could lose their funding and they're, you know, they're doing something they're not that nobody's supposed to know about basically with black money. Um, so they have the meeting with him and they, and he's Tom Wilson admits, like he thinks that it's being, it's UFO is being used as a cover, but it's really like, you know, Russian or some kind of other technology that we found. And the, the people in the program are like, no, 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 no. This, these were, this technology is not made by human hands. And they go on to talk, um, you know, the same thing, right? We have recovered off-world vehicles and we we work on it. It's highly compartmentalized. Uh, you know, it's kind of been brought into the private sector. You can't FOIA it. It's proprietary, right? If it's in a corporate setting. So you the government kind of loses a little bit of access to it because it's proprietary corporate information. You know, they can legally say you're not allowed to about our company, right? It's It's proprietary. So um, they end up telling him they have a full intact craft, right? And this is some of the stuff that David Grush has testified to Congress about, right? So that's a separate source that's saying the same thing about these crash retrieval programs that some of them have intact crafts. Um, So they tell Tom Wilson, you know, you're not on the bigot list, so you don't have access. We're not going to show anything with you or share anything with you, but as kind of like a courtesy and so you'll leave us alone, we'll tell you a little bit. You know, um, and, you know, they tell them that, you know, they have the off. They try to make sense of it every few years. And then again, they put it away, they shelve it and they, they revisit it and try to make the advancements. But um, they, they, there are certain parts of the technology that they just can't crack. And, you know, the significance of that, that document, right. The, the Wilson Davis memo, which came out in 2019, I believe. And, you know, some of me and my friends had it earlier than it was like really, really out there in the public. And at the time I was speaking to Eric, Dr. Eric Davis and I got a, um, I got a quote from him uh, for public use. So I, I was speaking with him and th- this is, this is funny because the quote I got from him, this was kind of like, I think like two weeks before the notes broke out big way. Um, but Lua Lozando, the intelligence officer that was, part of the ATIP program ends up going on Fox with Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson's like, do you, do you believe that the U S government had materials or debris from UFOs? And uh, Lou Elizondo like, uh, you know, I have to be really careful about what I say because of my security clearances. And it looks like he's going to just back away. But then he says, uh, but actually simply put yes. So, and Tucker Carlson's like, right. This guy who was in charge of the UFO program for the, for the government just said that he believes that the U S government is in possession of crash retrievals basically. And so I asked Eric Davis that night, um, I said, what do you think of loose statement on Tucker Carlson? And so Dr. Davis replies, you know, I think that, uh, you know, paraphrase Lou Elizondo's, um, statement on Tucker Carlson about, uh, the U.S. being in in possession of uh, you know UFOs and UFO technology, and first he said crashed UFO technology, and then he changed it and said no, use this quote, crashed and landed uh, UFO technology is one thousand percent accurate, and in it, you know, then the notes break out right and is public and everybody kind of like realizes that Dr. Eric Davis is a lot more involved in this than people assume that he was involved somehow, right. With getting access to crash retrieval uh, information, right. Whether, however he did that and whatever he was tasked with. Um, So the notes come out and it was like a huge deal because, you know, again, those notes took that meeting took place with Dr. Eric Davis and, and Tom Wilson in 2002 
and now it's 17 years later, 2019, the notes go public. And people at that time realized that Stephen Greer had the meeting, Mitchell and Will Miller and Tom Wilson in 97. So now people are putting everything together. And uh, you basically, it, in the gist of all that, you have Vice Admiral Tom Wilson, who was the deputy DIA director. But by the time he had the meeting with uh, Dr. Eric Davis, he had been the director of the DIA. And then when he had the meeting in 2002 with Dr. Eric Davis, he had just retired and went to the private sector. And uh, they met in Las Vegas at an eg and parking lot and all that. So now when the notes come out, everybody puts all these different pieces together and, and you basically have Vice Admiral you know, saying to Dr. Davis that we have recovered UFOs, crashed and landed. So, um, and, and now, you know, several years in the future now from 2019 into 2023, you have David Grush, who was, you know, this guy was somebody who prepared, you know, presidential briefings, not necessarily on UFOs, maybe, maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know if we would ever know that, but on other intelligence, because he worked with the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is one of the most secret and highly classified uh, government agencies and the NGA, you know, uh, National Geospatial Agency, which is dealing with uh, satellite images and we're going to track a UFO. You know, these are the two places you would do it because it's all the satellites. Right. Um, and and because David Grush ended up, you know, the reason he got involved you know, and I would I would recommend everybody watch the the UFO hearing. That it's on YouTube. If you if you type in you know 2023 UFO hearing, it's going to come up or oversight yeah. Uh, yeah, Congress oversight. Everywhere. Yeah, the Congress Oversight Committee. You know, David Grush has has testified under oath before Congress, along with two Navy pilots who were involved in you know one was involved with the Tic Tac incident. Uh, Lieutenant Commander David Fravor involved in the t- you know he testified to what he knows. Uh, especially about the Tic Tac incident. And then you had uh, Lieutenant Ryan Graves retired um, who was involved with a bunch of UFO or UAP incidents on the East coast in 2014, 2015 with the, the other videos that came out and they're like, Hold, um, uh, Holy shit. What is that, man? You know, they're like, you see, look at that on the ASA and there's, there's a whole fleet of them, you know? So he was involved with those incidents, but you know, David Grush, you know, part of how he came information about crash retrievals was that he was assigned to the UAP task force. So after those videos were released in 2017, actually in, I think 2018 or 2019, we officially got the UAP task force to say, Hey, wait a second, what's going on. And, and, you know, not, not so much of the public knows, but the re- some researchers know and the people that were involved in, in these programs know, like Dr. Eric Davis, who was involved in the UAP task force, at least unofficially. Uh, and these same people, Hal Putoff and uh, Lou Elizondo, I, you know, again, to whatever capacity, either officially or unofficially, are involved with the UAP task force in, in 2018, I believe, and onwards to investigate what does the government know about um UFOs. What, you know, what happened to these incidents that are being reported that they said a tip ended in, uh, you know, the government said, Oh, a tip, uh, ended in 2012. Lou Elizondo says, no, it didn't because I was the director of a tip until it ended. And when, at, you know, after he left until, until he left. So, and he, he came out in 2017 to the New York times. So, just a month before he came to the New York Times, he had he the director of ATIP, and that's 2017. So that ATIP, which never really ended, morphed into UAP task force. You know, just so people have a contextual understanding of the timeline. So UAP task force was formed, and you had uh, Jay Stratton, who was also involved in ATIP and OSAP. Uh, I, I believe becomes the director of uh, UAP task force and uh, David Grush is assigned to the UAP task force to investigate as part of their investigation. So while David Grush is, is basically given orders to investigate it by the government on an official capacity to investigate UFOs and UAPs, 
uh, while he's working with the UAP task force, he is investigating and he finds individuals, but also individuals start coming to him. And, and I mean, you need to look into David Grush's background because the level that this guy was cleared to is insane. Again, NRO and NGA are extremely highly. I think they said that, that David Grush had access to like 2000 special access programs, which is insane. You know, those most people are not going to be assigned to more than one or two or whatever it is of those programs. He had a really high clearance and oversight to special access programs. Um, and, and context, if you want to hear more about Grusher's background, you read uh, the debrief article that was written by Leslie Kane and Blumenthal again on the debrief about that's how his story came out uh, was through that debrief article. And then subsequently he was on news nation giving like a, a, his testimony, which ends up being like a 45 minute video that was released on news nation. Just so you understand how involved and how clear that David Grush um, is or was. And here, you know, you have David Grush testifying to the same things that while he was on official duty and while he was officially tasked to investigate this, he has, you know, again, he found some people and then, he said people that he knew in the defense and intelligence um, industry uh, for years, like he knew these people and they were super highly cleared and classified uh, people were telling him and providing information like documents. And, and again, I don't know what he can public possibly photographs and maybe videos um, again, that, that there's a crash retrieval program and that there's bodies that have been recovered and that there's a reverse engineering program or, you know, UFO technology exploitation program. And he had over 40 plus witnesses that work directly on these programs to this day, that they still work on these programs to this day, uh, give him information. And he, while he was investigating this, he started receiving reprisals. There were there. So there was retaliation against David Grush personally while he's assigned to do this investigation. So he had to put in an, in, in, you know, intelligence community inspector general um, complaint because he's, he's investigating this at an official capacity and now he's being targeted. Right. Well, and, like you said, there's two different, right. You know, exactly. trains of thought on how it should be handled. Exactly. I'm sure that's always been the case. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, but the, but the side that's been trying to be more transparent has, has gained momentum just recently since 2017. Right. Right. And now they have, they have some force behind them. I mean, now that, that Congress is so from 2017, like Congress didn't really know about all this. When that came out, it gave insiders the excuse and the ability and the bravery to start speaking to people in the Senate intelligence committee in the Congress and oversight committees, the armed service committees at 2017, they started receiving briefings from some of these people. And, you know, we find out through David Grush's testimony, he was able to start providing some of this information to the two key people who, and I mean, like if you look at the Congress now, and even if like Chuck Schumer recently put out language in the National Defense Authorization Act for 2024, and you know he's the Senate Majority Leader, the most powerful man in the Senate, and he's he put out language that is saying in the language 22 times it says non-human intelligence, right? Right. He's not just putting that there 22 times randomly, right? He. Even if he won't publicly admit it or whatever it is, he knows something. He's putting that language that he's informed, right? There's other and there's other people in these committees that probably have been briefed on 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 a very secure level and are convinced and they're taking action. That's why we're seeing this here the hearing come together at all, right? We had the hearing is unprecedented. There's never been a UFO hearing in 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 the history where you had service members testify it's always been other people that are speaking to to ufo evidence this is right. firsthand testimony from people who are actively involved and well i would say you know like but you know think about it like i understand what you're saying about congress but you know well congress should know i mean okay 
pe- certain people in Congress should probably know. But I mean, Congress is just some guy who decided right. they're representatives, they're run, right? Right. You know what I'm saying? People but, are like, oh, well, Congress is in the government. Well, wait a minute. Congress, yeah. is, they're, they're just representatives. Like this is some guy who honestly a year and a half could have been running a grocery store. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, just yeah. because. But, but, but the significance here is that, you, I mean, publicly you can see that they're pissed, right? Yeah. You, you can see that you can see the actions that are being taken. Over the, the last course of years, there's been several of these NDAA, National Defense Authorization Acts, where like the one from last year, there was f- over 40 pages dedicated to UAP. And in the language, you can see the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Congress are trying to get answers so, because they've been kept out of the loop. So there are, are actions being taken for more transparency. You know, you have Senator uh, Gillibrand, right. who's also from New York, publicly stating, you know, that if she came into the information that this is real, she wants the public to know. And I don't, I don't think that this is some kind of show or or political move or whatever. I think because again, you do see the bipartisan support, and you see actions being taken. That where if they wanted to, they could have just all had some secret meeting somewhere. We would have never known about it and never heard about it. And that would have been the end of it. I don't think it's, you know, like, you know, I don't think it's a a show. I think people that genuinely just don't know and aren't being kept in the loop because they're under kind of the whole delusion that, that really that everybody's under, which is something that even you said, you're like, well, you know, we're in a, we're living in a democracy. Like, we're not living. It. We're technically we're, a we're, we're, we're not republic. A we're a democratic republic, right? So right. you know, there's a whole other system of government and bureaucracy that is 100%. going on and has been going on for over a hundred years. What two hundred years, I guess? But let's say a hundred years, where it's been, let's say, let's say, well, I guess less than a hundred years, maybe, on this subject that has compartmentalized its self in such a way as to keep it from scrutiny from those people that believe we're living in an open right um transparent democracy right and and so now that there's about to be just now they're slowly being so discovered they're freaking out yes well and see that's the thing and 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 part of the thing about the secrecy i don't i don't think people are will are so shocked about ufos right i think one of the hardest things that for people to realize right when, when they learn about this and they learn this is true and when this is publicly acknowledged officially is not that other entities exist and they're interacting with us. Yeah, that's kind of like, wow, that's amazing. But they have to come to terms that they've been lied to, right? Their government lied to them intentionally to keep this away from them. So what else? What else are they lying about? What else are they keeping secret? It it flips the table I, I upside down. Pretty much, this, is, this is probably the big one. So it is. It is. I can't so, imagine. I'm sure there's lots of little things, but this is the big one. Yeah. Yes, for sure. And and so, but then at that point, you have to question your entire view of the world, your country, everything. You have to question everything at that point. Again, like I, for me, with the experience, it's it's on a very deep and personal level. But with this being public and what we're seeing happen, there's a few kind of key things here. Number one. P- this whole thing is being exposed. So the secrecy, the disinformation, how the issue was handled. So, but that also gives us the the opportunity. I'm not a utopianist by any means, but this gives us an opportunity to start to get on a better path and say, you know, if we can correct this issue a little bit, right? Like there's more, maybe that that can shift over into other parts of government where there's more transparency, you know, for different reasons, right? It gives us an opportunity to to create change, essentially. You know, how far that can and will go, I have no idea. I'm optimistic. I think this is a really teachable moment. I think we can learn a lot from this whole thing. You know, not just, you know, because also you have to realize like people are going to know now, like somebody's fucking watching us. You know, excuse right. my French. Like pe- we're being watched by a higher intelligence and what the hell are they thinking we're doing, Right. I mean, there's going to be people who don't like, don't care, whatever. Wow, we're being observed by a higher intelligence, and they must think we're nuts. You know, like what? Look at what we're doing. Um, <laughs> just look how we act, right? Like, 
these are like we're hiding stuff from our own people essentially right there are, are there's people with certain amounts of influence that are have misused power and 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 essentially th- it affects us all though right right so this is a chance to to realize that and uh, potentially start to make change um in in better directions and the reason i'm i'm optimistic a little bit on that at, at least is because we've already seen some of those changes begin and it might just right now be mostly with the UFO stuff and the secrecy stuff and UAP transparency and how oversight has been um, undermined, but we've already seen Congress and Senate and bipartisan parties, you know, they have come together, work together on an issue, put their differences aside and actually make a change. And we've we've been seeing that happen in real time the last six years, which it's it's pretty unprecedented. So maybe that will carry over into other other you know subjects and and issues. Maybe we'll, they'll say, "Wow, look what we did when we came together and and tackled this issue and the changes we made." Maybe just maybe we can do that with other things too. Maybe right. Again, I'm optimistic by nature. I'm hopeful. I'm not naive, but but maybe maybe that will be a demonstration of we really need to get shit done. We can get it done. I doubt that, but I, I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm not naive, but I'm optimistic. Yeah. Maybe because again, because again, and I don't think this is like a overnight thing, right? It's, I think this is a generational. Like this is going to take decades because because now. We're gonna we're gonna come to the acknowledgement officially, because in that Chuck Schumer language, it says we need a plan to disclose this to the public. You know, with plan, there's there's the kind of subtle thing of like we have to plan how we're gonna communicate this. Which you know, obviously, there's gonna be some kind of narrative that's unavoidable. We have to acknowledge that that the, they're not gonna paint themselves in a bad light. That you know, why would they? Um, but you know there there is a plan to disclose this to the public at least on some level, right? Right. Who knows how, what they're going to end up officially acknowledging and disclosing? I do think that the crash retrieval issue has been purposely put been put forth front and center for a reason. I think they are going to address non-human intelligence. I think they are going to address crash retrievals and um, reverse engineering programs. I think that that will be publicly acknowledged. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I don't know, I don't know how much, I can't imagine how much further than that, because even that is tremendous. So I don't know how much further than that they'll go, but you know, with that, you're going to have a new, I mean, certainly us, we kind of have that idea, but future generations, like even the young, the people who are kids now are going to grow up knowing for a fact that we're not alone, right? That, that we are, you know, despite our differences, we are one human family, right? So there's, there's going to be generations growing up with that mentality, right? They have to, right? My, my personal, um, uh, suspicion, which could very well be wrong is I don't, I don't think that the UFO or UAP intelligence, what the the others or whatever you want to call non-human intelligence. I don't think that, uh, they're a, a detrimental threat to us, right? Um, could there be if, threats involved in different if ways? Were, we wouldn't be here, I, they, right? It, it, right. would have been over, right? Like does that does that mean here. that they don't? Ha- they could still have their own self interest that inter- that interferes with our society a little bit, but I, I don't think they're looking to wipe us out or you know whatever it is, right? Or take control or you know what whatever that case may be. I don't know. I don't know that's the fact, but I don't I, think I don't, that's the case. Yeah, I don't think that. Like, listen, if they wanted us gone, like it would be as simple as they would just sprinkle some, you know, they right. sprinkle some, some Pathogen, dust and, and, yeah. and, and everybody with a human DNA would be wiped off the planet. Like it Correct. wouldn't be difficult. Right. So, yeah. Um, so I, yeah. so what I wanted to say with that is you're going to have future that are kids now and even teenagers growing up with the mentality that we are one human society we're one human family and maybe to some extent like we have to stick together just in case right because maybe there's others out there that are visiting us now they're are advanced and they're not they're they're not 
an overt threat to us. But now that we know there are those others, we may encounter others in, in 20, 30, 100, 200, 300, 1,000 years from now that we really need to be on the same page and not killing each other because we might have to stick together for our own survival, right? Oh, yeah. It's, so, you know. I mean, I think – so what I mean is the, the, so that, which might be even intentional about the UFO phenomenon socially conditioning us, um, is that, you know – I think to some extent people are going to have a mentality that like we kind of have to not kill each other and, and stick together to some extent because we have to, right. It, just to even ensure our own survival. So, I mean, that might even be part of why the threat narrative is so, you know, other than the defense issues is being put out there. So that's why I say I'm optimistic because I think that this issue of non-human intelligence uh, has the potential to to teach us and and make us grow in a positive direction you know whether we take that initiative or not is up to us right our individual and collective actions are going to decide that and it is up to us um but you know i'm again i'm optimistic so i i think that people have the ability to to make the right and, and start going down a path that way and eventually over time you know we're going to see a greater change, you know, maybe not utopian, right? I don't think it's going to be a utopian thing, but I think that we can grow in a constructive direction. Well, I don't think, I think humans by nature need a struggle. So I think, right. But I we have it. Now we have be, it. Yeah. Utopia would be hell. Eventually be great it, for about, about three dissolve. months. It would, yeah, it would dissolve. Right. I don't, I don't think, yeah, we need a challenge. We need that kind of, you know, utopia yeah i think it's too idealistic yeah it's kind of like the matrix thing where he's yes yeah yeah, absolutely they kept failing yeah listen there's there's a there are science there's there was a i don't know how many times i think they've read i think they've um done the same experiment several times where they had like mice generation after generation of mice that they were simply just feeding and keeping alive and and initially they're having children taking care of their children um, and reproducing, but after six or seven generations, they stop having sex that much. They stop taking care of the children that they do have. They they start becoming like almost depressed. They start um, like they, there's it's a whole breakdown of the their entire society just because it's such a perfect situation for them. Yeah, like you by nature, individuals or you know species in 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 general have to have some words well you remove that it's chaos it's horrible breaks down um you know maybe that challenge partially or you know could instead of us like fighting for domain over the earth we'll have other places to explore and you know i always think that to some extent we're going to have yeah differences and and some level of of conflict but you know you know, if we have a great challenge like trying to discover in space and, you know, all these other like planets and stuff and potentially gather resources and we're, we're not fighting so much amongst each other just to survive, you know, there's maybe less of that. Right. And, you yeah. know, but we'll again, we're, yeah, we'll be we probably won't be here to see and, it, but, um, right. We, correct. Correct. Yeah. No, they're going to, they're going to, they have to drag this out. Um, yeah. I, I, I it, like to me, why not just come out like at this point, it's already basically out there. Might as well just come out and say, look, we've got these crafts. Here's what they are. We'll give you, we're going to release X amount of information. There's some stuff we're going to keep just for national security, but yes, at this time, this is what happened. These are the document uh, documented incidents. These are the, like that to me would be, and really, I think that would practically nip it in the bud if you said, "Hey, we're reverse engineering certain programs. We're not going to tell you what they are." You know, like I'd be, I'm okay with that. I think I'd like I, the concrete. I think we're going to see that in in not a long time from now. Like, there, there's already more hearings planned. There's a meeting happening. It's on my later. bucket list. I just need that. I, I yeah. just need personal. I hear just you. My personal bucket. I just need it so I yeah. can be like, don't. Yeah. And well, I have so, a few people to apologize to. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, you know, so I think later this week, there's going to be 
it's not a congressional hearing, but like Tim Br- Burchette and, and others are going to be there talking about the UAP issue in DC uh, on, I believe it's the 17th. And I believe that will be publicly viewable. Uh, but in September, there's supposed to be another hearing, right? Right. And, and, you know, based on what I know, speaking to different researchers and, and people that are involved in the background, it this is not slowing down. This is not losing momentum. This is only going further and further. And the, the people I've spoken to that are were involved with some of these programs have said, you know, their push that they're doing for this is they're trying to go all the way. That's the plan. And these are people that are intelligence and military, and they're very mission oriented. You know, um, they're very serious about this, and they're not going to stop until until it sees the light of day. And I think I was just say, you know, what's interesting to me is like I was kind of, you know, I've had those moments where it's like, well, why that if there are so many people involved in these programs, how come at some point they don't come out? But I I keep thinking about like. um shoot, what was his name? Uh, Snowden, you know, like, like, you know, well, yeah. documents and, yeah. and the government doesn't care what, right, what comes out. Like, I don't care what, well, what you're doing is wrong. I don't care well, whether so you think it's wrong or not. Some, some people have out over time, like Phil out on his dead, basically. Right. Because, um, but if you're, if you're 45 years old and you got two kids, and right. you're thinking, you're thinking, I know all this. I got information. I got this. You know, people, some people will say, why don't you come out? Bro, because I got two kids and a wife, bro. Like so, I'll, I'll go to prison. You think they won't throw me in prison? So, and here's the thing. We, we've seen some people like that. Like Lou Elizondo left his career at the Pentagon where he's at the top of his game. You know, you look up Lou Elizondo's credentials. This dude is, I don't know if I could walk away from that job and he's got kids, right? Right. Um, and he he walked away from that job to to help push this forward. Now he probably has r- retained his security clearances and can and can work in the uh, you know in um, you know uh, defense industry, right? But that's still a risk. There might be people that don't want to hire him because of right. that too. So um, so he he faced a a, a lot of um, you know pushback for what he did. But, he, but he's also not walking away with actual documents. He's not walking away with really secure documents, is he? I mean, he helped get the tapes out. I'm not. I'm not going to say to what he got to who, right? I can't right. say that. Well, you he's know, doing for, it in such a way that he's got plausible, you know, kind of deniability, right? Like I look 100. You know, yes. When from me, you know, he can at least. Yes. It's not like you're walking out saying, "Look, here's yeah. this." He here's he did this. it in the way that it had to be done because if he just came out with the information, it's not going to correct the issue. People are going to say, "Oh, that's true," or other people are going to say, "Oh, this is bullshit," and we're still in the same spot we are, we've been in for the last seventy years. What Lou Elizondo did, Chris, Christopher Mellon, David Grush, and all these people that have been pushing for this—they've done it through official channels that has resulted in creating the change we're seeing because they did it the right way. The Disclosure Project was a great initiative. I don't think we would be here without it but the way it was done it was almost brushed off right because it 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 got the awareness out there but nobody was brave enough to make the changes it didn't go through the proper channels it was just like you know to hell with it you know we are we're just putting this out there and again it it ultimately led us here because i don't think we would be here now if those events didn't occur with with Stephen Greer and then that, cause you know, the disclosure project was in 2001. Right. But and uh, Lawrence Rockefeller and, you know, Bill Clinton tried to get involved and got pushed out and other people tried, this was going on in the early nineties. So it took from early nineties with project starlight with Stephen Greer and Lawrence Rockefeller and, and Bigelow was involved back then. And all of these people were involved until 2001 when the disclosure project happened just to get that meet that event in Washington DC to occur. And from 2001 to 2017 for more people on the inside, realizing that this is true and working together and Harry Reid creating the offset program in 2008 and getting a program on the record, which was later publicly disclosed by Lou Elizondo and acknowledged by everybody else who was involved. Um, you know, which there are a lot of people, a lot of people made this happen from the inside. And, you know, again, there's been distrust over that because there's, oh, you can't trust these people, but you know, who else are you going to get the information other than the people that are involved? Right. Right. So, and so there's, there's a lot of distrust in, in, 
in some of the the research community uh, because they're paranoid and they should be, but that's the really 90 year cover up, basically. You know, um, right. it has this, it's created a cognitive dissonance and, and it's, you know, the cover up has, has been, has done a lot of damage. Right. Um, but now, you know, you have another individual who came forward who I've mentioned uh, a bunch of times now is David Grush. Right. So David Grush came out, but he did so f- like in an, uh, through an official channel he went to the community inspector general and put an official complaint. Not only that he, he witnessed these things, these programs being mismanaged, but also that he faced retaliation personally and was in fear of his life because of this. And the, in, the intelligence community inspector general, um, as reported by the, that debrief article on David Grush, deemed his his uh, testimony and the evidence that he provided to the intelligence community inspector general he deemed it urgent and credible okay and 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 david grush has given over 11 and a half hours privately on all all the information he knows to uh these people right in the the intelligence community inspector general and maybe people within congress that that he 11 and a half hours of testimony but also provided all the evidence to support his claims and there were people that have worked directly on the program other whistleblowers david grush vetted have also testified in a classified setting you know privately to these intelligence community inspector general and and maybe in different committees there's uh, several of those 40 plus witnesses have also uh, um, supported and cooperated and verified what David Grush reported initially. So there's, there's a ton of, of other witnesses that are out there that have worked or do work directly on these, these UFO crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs that have spoken to, to the people that can actually do something about it. And that's why we're seeing this groundswell. And that's why we're seeing everything happen now because I, you know, these people that are making these uh, the language and these decisions now, basically they're in the loop now and, and there's no, there's no going back basically. Right. You're not putting this one back because somebody, you know, at any given time, if if things don't go a court, if things don't go the nice way, some of these people are going to put the information out anyways, right? There's fail yeah, say, You don't really want to come out officially and say, "Listen, it's just not the case," uh, you know, you, and, and take a hard stand at this point because then suddenly, suddenly people get frustrated and they come out and they go ahead and they say, "I'll bite the bullet. I'm going to release some stuff." Right. And, and now and, you're the guy that was standing in front of the podium lying. Yeah. Well, and and the thing is, like now there's there's enough momentum and there's enough support that when that information comes out now it won't be disregarded people will investigate it actively and when when they investigate it they're going to find they're going the, the information and you know I'm convinced that several of these people have already have their some of their evidence and testimony stashed somewhere nice so if things don't go the right way there are people in key places that are going to release the information anyways, and it's going to come out to the public one way or another. So it's in the best interest of Congress and the Senate and even people within these programs that are trying to stonewall this. It's within their best interest to go along with what's going on because they're only going to get hurt if they don't because David Grush provided locations, personnel, code names and code numbers everything of where these programs are, how to find them, how they're funded. And even in some of the recent NDAA language, people have been given uh, anonymity to come forward within a certain time. And if they don't come forward and they're found after that, the six month period or 60 day period, whatever it is, they're They could be charged criminally under prosecution for not coming forward when they were asked. So, it's within their best interest to comply basically. And right. they're, again, they're being, they're being given amnesty to some degree. So they, even if they're part of a program like this, or they have knowledge of it, they're not going to be penalized by the government 
They're not going to be persecuted for being involved. You know, they can come forward safely with the information, testimony, and the evidence that they have on this, just specifically pertaining to the UFO or UAP subject, and provide it to the proper people that they need to, the proper committees, um, and they will they will not receive uh, retaliation or you know they won't get in trouble for it. Well, if you're one of the people that don't want this to come out, you are in charge of one of those. You got they've got to, uh, those agencies or or commit. Uh, uh, programs and they've got to be freaking out right now. Hell you yeah. Know? Hell mean, yeah. Love to be in the, one of those meetings. <laughs> yeah. like, everybody's like, there's, there's been speculation in the research community about that too. And I don't, I don't want to contribute to, to rumors, but yeah, that's, that's certainly the case. And I, I think there's enough people that are within those programs that are on board that they're, they've, they're complying. And, there, you know, the reason that David Grush was able to come out was because the prior year in the NDA language, the National Defense Authorization Act language and the Grand Amendment, they called for whistleblower protection. So that's how David Grush was able to come out as a whistleblower. He's the first official UFO whistleblower in history. And so his case is highly important. And the fact that he was able to testify under oath in front of Congress is super important. And I think it's really important that people get behind him and support him. The people that are willing to come behind him and follow up and be whistleblower watching how David Grush is being treated. So I think we really need to support him so people will be encouraged to come behind him and share and be uh, whistleblowers to this subject as well. Well, listen, I and you, you, you. Do you talk about this on your channel, all this, uh, the different things that are happening? Or what is your channel, your YouTube channel specifically going over? Do you go into I talk about everything. I talk about everything. So I I talk about um, contact and CE5 and experiencer stuff, but I also talk about this issue. And, uh, you know, again, I'll I'll go into some history stuff sometimes. I'll, but current events for sure. The last uh, the last interview I did with Robbins, who uh, does, has Post Disclosure World, you should have him on as a guest sometime. He's a great uh, he's a researcher, but he makes great film up. Uh, I think you'll you'll be entertained by his videos, but also informed. Um, so I, I cover all this on my channel, engaging the phenomenon because it's important. You know, I think. Right. And the thing is, it's everything is so fast nowadays. Like years ago in the research community, if shitty news article we were like yes victory it's it's like a full-time job now it's it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on that's how fast it's moving now we're so interconnected at this point yeah well Um, and there's happening there's so many like congress witnesses coming forward new information coming forward new more reporting on it um you have other mainstream reporters um my i believe his name michael scheller i hope i'm not messing up his name the reporting you know, he's an investigative journalist. Um, I think he wrote an article for the time. And he's spoken to some of the witnesses, some of these whistleblowers, and he can't share their identity, but he's saying he's vetted, you know, their credentials. They are who they say they are. They have the security clearances that they claim to have. And they're telling him, like, we have these crafts. We have the reverse engineering programs and, uh, you know, bodies and everything. And, um, so there's other investigators like him. And he, he even said this on uh, the, the skeptics, uh, Michael Schumer. I mean, uh, Michael, uh, I'm thinking on his name now, uh, the guy who's uh, the skeptic guy. Um, I don't know who that is. All right. Yeah. Like every, 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 everybody we're talking about, he's, he's like the official skeptic. Um, but he, you know, uh, Michael Schirmer, Michael Schirmer. So Michael Schirmer runs like a skeptical podcast and, he had uh, th- this gentleman on, and they were talking about these issues. And uh, again, he's written an article about it. So, and again, Leslie Kane is another journalist, and Ralph Blumenthal. That you know, people need to keep track of their work and what they're saying. Ross Coltart has done a lot of work on this uh, with uh, David Grush on News Nation. Um, you know, I'm not crazy about mainstream news sources. But News Nation has taken this topic on full on. And when it comes to this, they've been doing excellent reporting 
uh, fearless. Basically, they're rep- they're not holding any punches. So if you go on like News Nation's YouTube channel and you're looking at their all their UFO content, they're they're not pulling punches. So if you know you want to stay up to speed, it's definitely you know it's a good idea to check some of those out either uh, as well. Okay. Well, listen, I I I appreciate you coming on, and you know, going over your story and and just you know talking about talking on the subject. You're clearly way more knowledgeable than I am. Um, uh, yeah. Well, you know, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, you have an, you have the open mind enough to and and the eyes to see that it, you know what's going on right in front of everybody's eyes basically now at this point. Well, I it's, think I don't, I can't imagine anybody at this point would would not realize that there's something obviously major that's happening. There's still some people that are like holding and it's uh, believe it or not it's like the hardcore scientific community like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mick West and others who who they some they yeah, think that Listen, yeah. 25 years ago, they would mock people that would look for other planets. Right, right, exactly. Like, really? There's hundreds of thousands of them now. Millions, what happened yeah. to the, be, being a What happened to being ridiculous looking for other planets now? Yeah, there's there's millions of Goldilocks planets. There's millions of Earth-like planets. Right, they exactly. Just, they're, they're in that perfect zone where there's, so, there's, there's a super good chance of life. And that's just our, that's just our galaxy, right? right. There's hundreds of billions of other galaxies right right? i I tend to because i'm i you know with time you tend to be wrong so often i tend to not dig in (laughs) on anything it's it's there's so much there's just so much information in our world today you can't keep track of everything you know like it's it's just crazy even with the ufo subject now it's like almost too much right and and any other subject subsequently like Again, this the, the astro- astrology and all this, it's just like, it's overwhelming. So you got to pick, <laughs> you got to use your time, uh, you know, skillfully. 